Good morning. Welcome to the world of RNA medicine, which is the topic for this morning. And you may notice that we have moved the postdocs who are, have the signs to wave that you have only five minutes left. We've moved them to a more central location. So um, when they're waving the sign, hopefully the speaker will, will, will be able to see it. Uh, it's my pleasure to reintroduce someone who already gave a spectacular talk, Jerry Joyce, uh, who, uh, in addition to his work on in vitro evolution of RNA and uh, RNA self-replication, also knows quite a bit about uh, RNA medicine because he ran the uh, Novartis Institute in San Diego for 10 years, six years, seven years, seven years. So yeah, I was, you know, a biologist if you're within 30%, that's not too bad. Seven years, and, um, uh, and uh, so knows quite a bit about uh, RNA therapeutics. So Jerry, take it away. Thanks, Tom. Welcome back, everybody. Uh, you know, I think we're all very much looking forward to this session, not just because of the science, but gratitude. Gratitude to our three speakers this morning and all their colleagues so that we can be here. So this isn't one of those crappy virtual meetings, right? Thanks to the vaccines, especially the synthetic mRNA vaccines, and of course, whopping numbers of infections across the globe. It's now possible for us to uh, have enough herd immunity that here we are. So, uh, so it's with gratitude and expectation about great science to come. So uh, our first speaker this morning is uh, Eckhart Jankowski. Uh, he is a card-carrying member of the RNA world, a long-time professor at, uh, at uh, Case Western, uh, studies HeLa cases, has studied HeLa cases, but in, I believe, July of 2022, or August, summer, last summer of 2022, uh, he made the crazy leap from academia to industry. Who would ever do something like that? Uh, maybe someday you'll come back like I did, but, but for now, I think he's having a really exciting ride as uh, the vice president for RNA science at Moderna. So, Eckert, it's all yours. Well, it's, uh, thanks. Can you hear me? I, I can hear myself, really. Okay, good. <laughs> Perfect. Well, uh, thanks. Uh, I, I would like to thank the organizers first for, you know, for giving me the opportunity to present at this super, super exciting meeting. And, uh, you know, it's, it's great to kind of get this really, really top-level overview over, you know, where, where, where the field is. And, uh, you know, and uh, I guess a year ago, I would have probably talked about um, uh, you know, the kinetic landscape of RNA binding proteins in cells or helicase mechanisms, but uh, well, here, here we go, and I'll talk about mRNA medicines. So, uh, so that I think that goes to show how short the distances are between very basic research and, and very applied research. Uh, so it's, uh, it's actually very exciting, and, uh, you know, and I really hope it stays that way. And especially for the, for the trainees, you know, to keep in mind that uh, things, you know, can change pretty drastic, or I mean, not in a drastic, uh, bad manner, but, but uh, you know, kind of, you know, these, these, these distances are short. All right. Um, so with that, I'd like to go into my uh, presentation that's entitled mRNA uh, Medicines. And, uh, you know, to signify the difference uh, between an academic talk and a and a talk for, you know, on behalf of a publicly uh, uh, traded company, I put this slide up. Uh, you can ask me questions later about this. Can you read that? <laughs> I'm just going to read it very quick to you. <laughs> All right. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, so an important point in. It's going to stop you real quick because I don't think the mic's going to come off. Oh, really? Okay. So my my ears are funny. <laughs> Here. Uh, okay. Let's see if that works for you. Is so that good? Okay, an important point uh, for, for, you know, a lot of the research that many of, of, uh, of us do is uh, to eventually translate this into medicines for, you know, for unmet medical needs. And, uh, and what you can see on this slide uh, from, a, from a recent review by Martin Eagley, uh, so there are a couple of uh, RNA medicines medicines that are made out of RNA that have been approved by the FDA. Uh, some were real big, big game changers like splicite, uh, uh, switching oligonucleotides that, you know, really enabled treatments of, of uh, diseases that, you know, you really couldn't do before. Um, and, and mRNA 
uh, it's a very recent edition. It's actually the most recent edition. Can, so you can probably not really see this. Uh, but anyway, I mean, I mean, so um, yeah, you know, I, I, I think we're getting along with, without the laser pointer here. Um, it, it's okay. So, um, so mRNA uh, in, uh, compared to, to, to other uh, non-mRNA medicines, so medicines that are made out of RNA, so mRNA uh, is kind of special in the sense that uh, non-mRNA medicines act on or modulate. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Ah. Yeah. Much better. <laughs> um, it's it's okay. Uh, oh. oh, oh. Ah, there we go, there we go, thanks. Thanks, Rachel. <laughs> um, so uh, so non-mRNA medicines act on or modulate endogenous mRNA metabolism. So and you can see in the simplified view of eukaryotic uh, RNA metabolism, there are many options to do this with a variety of different RNAs. Uh, most of uh, uh, cellular uh, uh, RNA metabolism is, in the end, culminates in translation, so that's what, uh, what RNA metabolism is ultimately for, but uh, what the difference is in uh, mRNA medicines is that they directly can encode proteins. So, uh, so that's, uh, you know, in contrast to uh, other agents that modulate endogenous mRNA metabolism, that um, raises unique possibilities, but also poses unique challenges, and this is what I would like to uh, talk about in the, in the, you know, the remainder of, of, of my, my talk to you. All right, so first, the possibilities. So in mRNA medicines, you can encode a wide variety of proteins, including multiple proteins simultaneously, and here is uh, the current Moderna pipeline. Um, uh, so, so there are really essentially limitless options, so to speak, you know, whatever you can encode in RNA. In theory, you can you know, kind of translate this into a medicine. There are, you know, there are, there are prophylactic vaccines, there are uh, cancer vaccines, individualized cancer vaccines. Um, there are uh, immunomodulatory uh, 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 proteins, systemic intracellular therapeutics, um, and, uh, and a, a couple of, of, of other uh, things. So this is uh, the, the, the current pipeline uh, for, for Moderna preclinical. Um, <clears throat> so in this, uh, you know, this, this incredible uh, wide variety of, uh, of proteins is really something that, uh, you know, it's very hard to match with any other modality. So another advantage is, and that has been, I think, witnessed by you know, the world, so to speak, is uh, very fast development timelines for, for RNA. So, so once it's clear what has to be encoded, um, you know, the RNA essentially gets designed. Um, and then the, the time between actually the design of the RNA and the actual manufacturing quality uh, testing uh, is fairly short. So this is actually, you know, it's, this is somewhat outdated, so you can actually make this faster uh, at that point in time. Um, oh, I think, I think it's, yeah, I don't know what's, what happened with my ear. So sorry, but I apologize on behalf of my anatomy here. <laughs> um, uh, so so, so and, and the biggest time is, is, is still the, uh, the, the clinical uh, testing. So, but for, uh, for the, uh, uh, for the COVID vaccine, that, that took about 11 months. So, so, and that's, uh, so that, that was true for, for Moderna and it was true for, for uh, BioNTech. So, so this is also something that is unprecedented. I think the, uh, the timeline for vaccines before is about like four to five years or longer. So, uh, so you know, that has very much revolutionized that, that field and the, and the timelines there. Okay, and then there's uh, a third advantage, and that is uh, that mRNA can be made relatively flexible uh, with comparably small and versatile setups. And you can see that this here uh, in this comparison, uh, you know, it's a, it's a, uh, the, 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 the size measure here. So the uh, actual manufacturer for RNA, clinical and uh, commercial, it's, it's really comparably small compared to, uh, uh, you know, standard industrial biotech setup. So, so that, you know, gives it an enormous flexibility to, uh, to, to uh, you know, to, uh, to implement these, these things. So these are, uh, uh, you know, the versatility, 
speed and flexibility are really uh, three advantages that are very, very, very hard to match with, with other, other modalities. So that has uh, really uh, raised a lot of interest in this, in this uh, modality. So, um, so the next part of, of, uh, of my talk, I would like to you know, kind of uh, point out a little bit of how the fundamentals of RNA vaccines, uh, uh, you know, how this actually uh, works, pointing out some of the challenges along the way, and, uh, you know, and then essentially get into you know, the, the, the next steps. So, uh, not surprising, RNA medicines, uh, uh, you know, it based on a, on a, on a, on a huge body of, of prior work, so it's not something that was invented in the last 10 years. It goes back to, uh, you know, I have, I've highlighted some of these things here, um, but, but they're all very important points. Um, liposome, mRNA delivery, and we'll hear a little bit about that from, uh, from one of the pioneers that, uh, that, that uh, invented this. Uh, mRNA delivery, um, clinical trials with uh, 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 mRNAs here uh, up to the, um, uh, the, the, the COVID vaccine that, uh, you know, that we're all familiar with. So how do we want to think about mRNA medicines? And the important part there is it's not just the mRNA, but it's actually uh, packaged mRNA. So it's, it's, uh, it's very important to keep in mind that the actual drug is the mRNA plus a lipid nanoparticle goes into the cell. I'll talk about it in a sec, how, that, uh, how we imagine that that is happening. And then it kind of hijacks the native RNA biology pathway, uh, uh, captures the ribosome, and then you, know, you can make these various proteins. So, so and as nobody uh, appreciates this more than, uh, than this audience, it's obviously not the same of whether you come from the nucleus with all the nuclear history, or whether you come you know, from, from this exogenous uh, route. <clears throat> okay, so an important point there is uh, lipid nanoparticles, so to speak, the packaging of the, of the mRNA. So, um, so the entire mRNA drug contains the mRNA, and the lipid particle is at least four parts, can be more. Um, and uh, an important part is the ionizable lipid, uh, that is actually a lipid that binds the RNA. You have to bind the RNA because RNA by itself doesn't really bind to the lipids. Then uh, it's a phospholipid that is essentially kind of the bricks of the, of the uh, LMP cholesterol that makes it somewhat flexible. And then there is a, a PEG lipid, so in the, in the PEG is there to keep the LMPs apart from each other in solution. So then in addition to that, then we have obviously water, we have uh, uh, a stabilizer, here is uh, sucrose, uh, salt, and that's essentially the, the drug. But of course, you know, there are many ways by which all these components can be put together, and that is, uh, you know, what makes it uh, challenging, but also full of opportunity for, you know, for variations of the drug. Okay, so how do, we, how do we think about, in a little bit more detail, how the, uh, the packaged RNA gets into the cell? Uh, that depends a little bit on the route of administration. And I've highlighted here systemic circulation. This is essentially in vitro, uh, 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 intravenous uh, delivery. So the RNA gets, uh, the, the LMP with the RNA gets into the bloodstream. Importantly here, the PEC actually dissociates, so that does not stay on the RNA. Uh, and that is important because then there are some components that are in the bloodstream, especially this APOE, uh, that uh, gets recruited to these uh, lipids, and that helps essentially the cellular uptake, especially in, uh, in liver cells. Um, and the, the uptake of the entire drug is uh, done by a process that's called endocytosis. Um, RNA gets with, with the LMP gets packaged in the endosome, and then uh, because of the uh, pH in the endosome is fundamentally different from the pH that it, uh, you know, the drug otherwise experiences, um, this is where the ionizable lipid comes in. So the, the charges get, uh, you know, get essentially inverted, and the membranes fuse, and that releases the, the RNA. So that's essentially how the RNA gets into the cytoplasm. And once it's in cytoplasm, Ribosomes get recruited and, uh, and protein is made. So that's, uh, that is essentially the, how, we, how we want to imagine how this actually you know, 
uh, ends up uh, in the, 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 the protein at the end. So important to keep in mind that there are distinct LMPs for different delivery goals, uh, whether it's subcutaneous in injection, intramuscular, which is what you know, most of us are familiar with for, for the vaccines. Um, sometimes you can inject RNA uh, without anything, intracardial. Um, so, and you know, we can all imagine that's for something you know, more on the serious side. Um, intratumoral injection, inhaled delivery, so, you know, so that's not really, uh, uh, so, so that's essentially, you know, kind of uh, breathing this in and uh, intravenous delivery. So, so in that, um, and the difference here is between the systemic delivery for intravenous and local delivery for, for all these, uh, these other options. So, so the LMPs are essentially uh, tailor-made for these, for these uh, different purposes. Now, once the RNA actually enters the cytoplasm, so it's very important that, uh, you know, to be effective, uh, then, you know, the RNA must not trigger the innate immune sensors, right? I mean, so, so cells have evolved to not necessarily accept any exogenous RNA. That usually in evolution was not considered to be a good thing if exogenous RNA enters the cell. So, um, so you know, there's all kinds of defenses that, uh, that are actually hardwired into the genome. And, uh, Two of the major parts that, uh, that have to be addressed when making these, these RNAs are endosome-associated uh, pattern recognition receptors, and we heard a little bit about that yesterday from, uh, from Brenda, and cytoplasmic pattern recognition re receptors. That's actually what, what Brenda was, was talking about. <coughs> so uh, so how, do we, how do we circumvent these issues? And, uh, Again, basic science helped here. Uh, so, uh, so it turned out that uh, for the endosome-associated pattern recognition receptors, um, uridine seems to be, unmodified uridine seems to be, uh, you know, the trigger. So, so uh, you can see this here. It's a paper from 2004 um, that uh, the induction of, uh, of the response to these, to these uh, you know, various uh, the poly RNAs, uh, homopolymers, uh, U really sticks out. So you got to do something about U. And uh, and what uh, what has been done about this, and I'm sure most of you uh, kind of know this a little bit, is you you modify the U. Uh, so and and what turns out to be a critical position is the five position of of the U. So and um, you know modifications you can do by using pseudouridine, which uh, you know puts this uh, this nitro group there, or and that is actually what you'll find in the, uh, in the, in the current vaccine, a uh, one-mesyl pseudouridine. So it's all, you know, essentially the five positions. So the, the one, one mesyl is because, you know, it's because chemistry. So, you know, the, that's a <laughs> the naming, the position one ends up in the position five of, of, the, uh, of the mesyl uh, pseudouridine. So, so in, the, uh, in the current mRNA vaccine, one mesyl pseudouridine uh, replaces you, so it's essentially all pseudouridines. Um, that, uh, that diminishes the recognition of the pattern recognition uh, receptors, maintains the base pairing. So, so and that's, that's the key. So, so essentially, you can still make uh, faithful proteins. Um, the, uh, the modifications also uh, diminish the uh, dimerization of uh, uh, TLR8, another endosome. Uh, associated pattern recognition receptor. So, so essentially, it turned out to be a, a fairly effective way to, to deal with the endosome-associated pattern recognition receptors. Okay, now, uh, one thing to keep in mind is that a uh, replacement of uh, one methyl pseudouridine, uh, uh, uridine with one methyl pseudouridine uh, does produce uh, faithful proteins, so that's pretty much what this uh, paper said. So that was not a commissioned paper or so. That was something that was independently done. Um, very clear finding. And uh, the modified RNA also in a head-to-head -head comparison for, uh, for COVID vaccines uh, also came out to be, uh, you know, to be significantly more potent than the unmodified vaccine. So this is uh, a head-to-head -head comparison that was done by CureVac, uh, who were big proponents of unmodified uh, nucleotides. 
And, uh, you know, but, uh, but it speaks, you know, to the scientific rigor that uh, after really having put this to the test until the very end, so that's essentially what, what, <laughs> what came out. So it's not published, uh, but, but the, the, the results of the, of the clinical trial have been, have been publicized here. All right, so what about the cytoplasmic pattern recognition receptors? I don't mean so once, you know, once the RNA is out of the endosome, you know, it's in the cytoplasm. And so and it turns out that these cytoplasmic pattern recognition receptors are an issue if you do not pay attention to this. So, so, so why do we need to pay attention to cytoplasmic pattern recognition receptors that you know, detect double-stranded RNA in some fashion? So it turns out that um, yeah, when you make the RNA with T7, so you make mostly you know, the RNA that you want, you know, there are some shorter RNAs that usually get, uh, you know, purified away, but uh, there are some side products that, uh, you know, that uh, recur uh, that are actually double-stranded. And, and that is actually not a totally negligible uh, amount of RNA that is double-stranded, and it turns out that that is actually a problem. So you have to deal with it in some manner. <coughs> so there are various ways to deal with this. And the way Moderna has dealt with this is they actually engineered CT7 to make less of the double-stranded RNA. So that was a, was a long, ongoing project it's published um, last year. Um, there are a couple of mutations that are introduced in the T7 that really significantly reduces the, the double-stranded RNA products. That, uh, that, so, so that makes a, makes a very, very, very significant difference. So and what also makes a difference is uh, a lot of process optimization. So, so that's also published, uh, was in 2020. So, so there's a lot of, uh, you know, tweaking of uh, NTP ratios and, and other reaction conditions. So, um, so it's actually kind of a uh, fairly big team that spent a lot of time <laughs> optimizing uh, the T7 uh, reactions. Yeah, so, so, so but, but it is a very important thing because, you know, if you, if you do stimulate the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the endogenous pattern, uh, recognition receptors, that is, uh, uh, that is something that, uh, you know, really limits the dose, and then, you know, there are all kinds of uh, undesired side effects. So, so, so double-stranded RNA is a big deal, and, uh, and it, to some extent, you know, continues, uh, you, know, uh, you know, to be somewhat of a limiter. I mean, even with this, uh, you know, improved, uh, you know, technologies here. Um, so, so, so you can see this here a little bit in the uh, amount of double-stranded RNA, uh, you know, when you optimize this, this I mean, the, the difference is, is actually, you know, very, 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 very significant. Um, all right. So, um, so the last topic that I would like to touch uh, a little bit is the, oh, oh, I got a five out of ten so far. <laughs> um, so uh, uh, is how actually, how, how do you make the RNA? So there are, there are many ways, there are many ways to skin the cat, but there are many more ways to, uh, to make an RNA. Uh, so uh, so the, the genetic code, as we know, uh, you know, you can encode uh, and give an amino acid by more than one, than one triplet. And, uh, you know, and if you make a protein that like, has these five peptides, very short, short protein, you know, there are 128 choices. If you look at the, the spike protein, you get this gigantic number that, uh, that exceeds the number of atoms in the universe in a, in a very significant manner. So, so it's essentially an unlimited way by which you can make any given RNA. So how do you get the best RNA or one of, one of, the, <laughs> one of the good RNA? So they obviously can't really test it. So even, with the, you know, the, the, even if you take, you know, like, 10 Illumina sequencers, it's never going to be, <laughs> it's never going to be something that's even close. So, um, so in the way, uh, this turn, turns out, uh, you know, what, what actually matters here is, uh, not surprisingly enough, it's, uh, it's a codon adaptation or, um, yeah, so, so as you can see this here on, the, on, the, on this line. And uh, what also matters is inherent structure. Of, of the RNA. So it's, it's actually from a, from a paper that was published in 2009. So if you look in, in this kind of two-dimensional parameter space uh, at random <laughs> choices uh, for, for RNAs, uh, so that falls here, the human genome falls into this range, but then there's a whole other range that can be theoretically accessed 
but that's not, you know, you would not find, uh, you know, these RNA essentially in the, in the human genome. Um, so you, if, if you look at actually what uh, the protein production is um, uh, here, so this is the relative uh, area under the curve. So if you, if you look at, you know, how the, how the uh, protein is being produced, you look at structure, uh, here categories the slow, medi uh, medium, and high, and 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 codon. So you, so you can actually see that there's quite a bit of a difference here. So so if you if you look at this uh, point here, which is on the intersection between a human genome and random choice, so you can see here uh, that that this is quite a bit lower than if you you know actually optimize this more outside of the of, of the parameter space that you would normally find in in, uh, in native RNA. So so there's a lot of uh, yeah, you know, and, and, and this is this is kind of you know coarse parameter space. I mean, I mean, there's obviously a lot more nuance here. So, so that is something that is, uh, uh, you know, worth spending a lot of time and effort on how to actually, you know, design the appropriate RNA. Uh, so, uh, okay. So, what's what's next? So, what I uh, you know what I can uh, share here is what's next uh, specifically for Moderna. And I'm sure we are here. Uh, in the next talk, what's next for, <laughs> for, for, for BioNTech. Um, so we're all aware of the, of the commercial product. There are four phase three and nine phase two trials, and there are uh, actually 47 development programs that, uh, that center around respiratory vaccines, latent vaccines, then public health vaccines, uh, and mRNA therapeutics. So this is all uh, vaccines. This is uh, therapeutics, so therapeutics are uh, so that's actually the, the, the reason why we call it mRNA medicines, because therapeutics are not exactly, uh, you know, the same as, as vaccines. Um, and these uh, mRNA therapeutics are four, uh, focused on four therapeutic areas, immuno-oncology, rare diseases, cardiovascular, and autoimmune. Um, and, uh, and one thing I, I'd like to point out that, you know, really has, has us all very excited is, uh, you know, the, the ability to actually, uh, you know, tailor uh, you know, essentially a medicine to a very specific individual. Uh, so, so in the in the, in the most um, uh, uh, the the, uh, the 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 most obvious uh, or, or the most like you know publicized uh, uh, approach of this is uh, uh, you know what we now want to call individualized neogen and the uh, 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 individualized neoantigen therapies. So this is a personalized cancer vaccines. Uh, and the way uh, this actually is done is so a patient uh, provides two samples, so one tumor and one comparison. Um, then essentially you identify uh, patient-specific uh, mutations and uh, uh, you know, select some of, uh, of these as neoantigens. You design the vaccine, manufacture it, and that's essentially how it looks like. So there are 34 neoantigens that are strung up on an mRNA. And, uh, and these are essentially, uh, you know, personalized, uh, you know, uh, uh, antigens for, you know, for actually helping the, uh, uh, you know, for, for, for essentially, you know, directing the immune system to the, to the tumor. So it's a, it's a very exciting way to look at these things. Uh, if you remember, well, yeah, it's probably hard to remember the details of what I, what, I, uh, what, I, what I showed before, but the idea is actually not new. But but now you know it's actually uh, you know it's actually implemented and it seems to be successful, especially in compare uh, if, if if it's done in in conjunction with uh, with uh, an antibodies. So um, so with that, I'll conclude my talk here. Uh, it's a big group that uh, you know that does, these are these are most of them. Um, employee number one is still here. This is uh, <laughs> it's uh, ask me questions about employee number one. Very interesting individual. Um, uh, so and I thank you for your attention. Thank you. Ecker, what's the favorite explanation for why highly structured mRNAs are making more protein? Well, um, probably ribosome load. So I guess, you know, it might not be a that that great to load too many ribosomes on the on the RNA. I mean, you make a lot of protein, but uh, but there seems to be some connection to, you know, to decay. So, who's making more? Your favorite mRNAs are more structured than those. Exactly. Ones. That's that's precisely right. So so 
So that's that's exactly right. So 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 more structure seems to be you know seems to be better. So it's not a stability issue. It's just a pure production issue. Um, no, that's a, that is a cellular stability uh, kind of thing. I mean, yeah, this, I mean, I mean, there are, there are two different things of whether you want, you want more stability in the vial or in, in the cell. So, so uh, thinking about your the um, mRNA therapeutics. So there's a couple things. I have a couple questions. One is, you know, how do you envision targeting? I mean, you could inject something into the brain to make a new protein, but um, are you guys thinking about targeting? The other thing is, if you just take your lipid nanoparticle, nothing in it, and inject it, does it elicit an immune response? It depends on, uh, on the lipid nanoparticle, and it depends on how you administer it. You have some that do not <laughs> trigger an immune response? But there's differences. I mean, I mean, eventually, you know, the, well, everything will trigger something, right? I mean, if you if you do it at uh, you know in, in, in large amounts of of things, but yeah, but but that that's that is uh, you know that's obviously something that uh, that was optimized prior to. So you know, a lot of uh, you know research has gone into putting the right lipids together. So. So for the therapeutics and wanting to deliver a messenger RNA to a specific place, are you guys? Working on that? What are you, how are you? Can you tell me anything? <laughs> but delivery is certainly something that is, uh, you know, that's a, that's a, that's a big limiter. Yeah. So that's. Uh, but like that's conjugating a peptide epitope or something yeah. within the LNP so that it's targeted a particular cell surface receptor, for example. Well, there's only so much I can tell about these things, as, as you can imagine. I tried, I tried. <laughs> or an aftermer. Or an aftermer. I'm talk to you Jennifer, yeah. Hey, Eckhart, over here. Oh, oh yeah. Hey, yeah. How, how are you thinking about RNA stability and the ability to deliver this to uh, places around the world that maybe don't have uh, yes. freezers and things like so that? So that that, uh, that touches the environmental stability. Uh, yes, that is something that uh, that is something that we that we are very uh, you know that's that's something of of, of interest. So. Well, I guess there's only so much I can tell about that too. <laughs> but, but, uh, but, but it is it, it is certainly something that is very much on uh, on everybody's mind. Yeah, I mean, I mean, not everybody has a minus 80 or a minus 20, uh, you know, to to store these, these things. I mean, I mean, you know, it, it, the products are, they do not fall apart like right away if you store it at room temperature. So, so you know, so one has to. You know, really keep in mind there's, you know, there's uh, the, the current regulatory things, right? I mean, and, 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 and they are there because, well, that's how they were, they were tested. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, if you, you know, if you let it stand around at, at room temperature, so eventually, you know, it'll, it'll you know, it'll diminish in, in potency. Now, reading between so, the lines, that part of what you're saying is there's, there's, you know, you're trapped in some historic protocols for GMP. That, you know, and the way in which things are stored, which were overkill in retrospect. You probably can't say that, but, uh, but I think, but Jennifer's asking it's, for something more fundamental. Can yeah, we yeah, yeah. Something room temperature, you know, just put it in a FedEx, you know, pallet and off it goes. And, uh, and yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, so, 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 so this is something that is very much on, uh, you know, on, on, on people's mind to, you know, so to do. I have, I, a, I have a question uh, about one methyl pseudo U. So, the methyl is a little uh, hydrophobic patch, so I'm wondering if that interacts with the lipid, and if that's a part of the formula. That's a good question. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Would you care to speculate on this? <laughs> okay, um, please. Oh. Yeah. And then. Hi. Uh, we, most of us get four or five shots now. So message on you, do you guys have any kind of new strategies to improve it? If you don't get another shot, it will be impossible to for long uh, term protection. Yes, that is a good point. And I guess, you know, everybody who has gotten the shot, that would be nice <laughs> if that could be, uh, could be reduced. Um, so, so interestingly enough, so uh, so that's very important to keep in mind. Uh, you know, these uh, you know the waning uh, you know protection is something that is not you know specific to the mRNA vaccine. I mean, I mean that that actually 
But first of all, you know, it actually happens even if you actually get infected, you know, which is like, you know, the zero control, so to speak. Um, and, uh, and it happens with, you know, with other modalities too. So, so this is, you know, it's more kind of an antigen thing. And it's, it's, you know, like how the immune system reacts, how sustainable things are, that is something that is really, really difficult to, you know, to judge in the, in the, in the, in the beginning. I mean, you know, there are some, some vaccines, uh, you know, historically that are great, you know, Yellow fever is a, is a gold standard, you know, you get, you get one shot and it lasts for your entire life. And, you know, other things are just, you know, you have to boost them up. I mean, it's, uh, that's just what it is. Last question, Larry. Um, I have a question about your pipeline and your rare disease, six, that were on the right side. Uh, since everything else you've done was designed to uh, achieve an immunological response and the most rare diseases that you might be working on you might replace a non-existent protein with a protein and vaccinate against that how are you guys thinking about that problem um yes so of course you know that, that's not where we want to you to have an immunological response so that is actually something you want to actively uh, avoid so so yeah I mean you know, you know, I mean you know dosing design uh, these are these are all things that that need to be optimized uh, on on you know on these fronts okay Eckhart thanks so much yep well thank you so while Aslam's getting connected you know uh, those of us that have been in the RNA world field for decades we used to apologize for mRNA. You know, it's like, oh, mRNA, it's just a message. And then we say, no, 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 there's this processing, it's really cool, and then there's all these other RNAs that do function and, and signaling. But now, it's the opposite. Now we like bask in the glory of mRNA. It's like, oh, you work on RNA, that's like the vaccine. So, so thanks to these guys, we're like legit, even in the general public, so. All right, I, it's my pleasure to introduce, actually it was my pleasure to have met this morning for the first time Aslam, Aslam Turki, uh, who is the Chief Medical Officer at BioNTech. Uh, she's an immunobiologist, medical scientist by training, also a serial entrepreneur. Uh, Ganymed was, uh, was something you co-founded back in the day and did quite well, uh, and then BioNTech. BioNTech, by the way, if you don't know, stands for Biotherapeutics New Technology. That's what the N is. So. Um, uh, and obviously, BioNTech, uh, together with Moderna, has, has changed all of our lives. So uh, if you're ready to roll, Uslim, it's all yours. Thank you for the kind introduction, Jerry, and thank you for, for having me. It's, it's a great pleasure to be here. I'm not good in keeping time, so you have to be very rigorous with me. And, the guardians of the clock and show your five minutes. Uh, uh, my, my talk will be about mRNA-based immunotherapies, and I'm very grateful to, to, to Eckhart, uh, who very eloquently uh, already to told us a lot about mRNA therapeutics and what you need to, um, to uh, as a foundation uh, for developing um, mRNA-based uh, treatments. And I'm, I don't have a disclaimer because I have my other hat uh, on today uh, as, a, as an academic. And uh, uh, this is because I actually want to bring you back to our roots. Why, back in our academic days, we became interested in working with, with mRNA. And the motivation was that in the light, late 1990s, uh, we were primarily interested as physicians and cancer immunologists to develop um, uh, cancer uh, vaccines, vaccines to treat manifest cancer disease. And um, so what do you need for, for such a vaccine? Uh, you need robust expression of the antigen, not just anywhere, but on professional antigen presenting cells. And you need presentation of this antigen on MHC class one and class two uh, molecules for induction of CD8 positive and CD4 positive T cells, not any T cells, but T cells of certain uh, phenotypes, Th1 
uh, type effector CD4 T cells, for example, and highly cytotoxic CD8 positive effector memory cells. And you need an adjuvant effect by an inflammatory innate immune signature. And back in those days, um, the two first um, requirements were addressed by the, at that time, small cancer vaccinologist community by uh, vaccine formats like peptides, proteins, DNA uh, mainly. And the third one, how to get adjuvanticity in there, uh, was not quite clear and people were trying different adjuvants. And we thought um, mRNA has a great potential here. In, um, on the one hand, with regard to its intrinsic adjuvanticity, so what we already heard about, the uh, innate immune sensor activation. So it was not at all in our interest to get rid of that. Um, and because of that, our entire cancer vaccine program is based on uridin mRNA. What we, however, were con concerned about was uh, the other two, uh, two um, uh, bullet points, namely robust expression on end presentation to, um, to activate and expand CD4 and CD8 T cells efficiently. And uh, the way we addressed um, in particular the potency uh, part uh, was by optimizations on the molecular design level. Um, uh, this included codon optimization, but this also included um, uh, design of uh, the untranslated regions, of optimizing caps, of, of finding the right poly A tail uh, length of um, single-stranded mRNA, because we knew uh, that uh, these have an impact on both the intracellular stability of mRNA and its translational performance. And as you can see here, as compared to the respective benchmark um, designs uh, back in those times, uh, by changing designs, you could indeed, uh, uh, indeed uh, improve uh, the protein decay kinetics considerably, in particular in human dendritic cells, which were the cells of interest in, for us. In order to add a bit more color to uh, what we did to optimize our backbone for cancer uh, vaccines, uh, here a piece of our early uh, work. Uh, we, for example, had high throughput screens ongoing in order to five, uh, find mRNA stabilizing um, uh, free prime UTR sequence motifs uh, which were M mRNA stabilizing. And one of these screens is shown here. We modified the Celex approach in order to obtain a cell system which allowed for uh, evolution and selection of free prime UTRs with uh, stabilizing capacity. And uh, this specific particular screen is based on um, constructing uh, free prime UTR mRNA libraries uh, uh, with reporter genes where the free prime UTRs were obtained from human dendritic cells because these are the cells of interest for the cancer vaccinologists which were pretreated with actinomycin D in order to enrich for stable mRNAs and these libraries were selected several rounds um, in, again, human dendritic cells, and we came up with a list of stabilizing uh, free prime UTR motifs. Unexpected ones uh, on the top of the list were free prime UTR mo motifs of AES and of mtRNAR1, and as you can see here, as compared to um, a, a human uh, beta globulin uh, um, free prime UTR, uh, each of these, uh, uh, these were better performing in terms of um, uh, translational performance and combining both as a tandem for, uh, for the free prime UTR, in particular with having the uh, mtRNR1 motive leading improved uh, the translational uh, efficiency even more, also shown here. And interestingly, because we had observed that free prime UTR uh, performance um, uh, improvements depend on the cell line. This specific um, uh, free prime UTR, which we are using uh, even nowadays in our uh, um, cancer, uh, in our uh, uh, vaccines, not only improved stability in human dendritic cells, but also other 
uh, cell lines and also improved uh, here in a mouse system uh, antigen-specific immune responses. So um, by in identifying um, such stabilizing uh, three prime, five prime UTRs, caps, and poly A, uh, A, uh, A tail lengths and combining them, we could get combinatorially a uh, strong stabilization which uh, allowed us to reach uh, the um, a potency which we needed for a vaccine. Another uh, area of improvement uh, was MHC class uh, 2 presentation. mRNA as such, uh, when it is um, uh, introduced into the cell cytoplasm uh, from the outside uh, and, and uh, the protein is expressed in the cytoplasm, has a poor presentation on CD4 molecules and as cancer immunologists, uh, on MHC class 2 molecules, and as cancer immunologists, we are very interested in getting highly potent CD4 uh, cells. And uh, the way we dealt with this was that we uh, again set up high throughput screens in order to identify what we would need to fuse in terms of routing or trafficking text to our um, uh, mRNA-encoded uh, antigens to ensure for a better uh, CD4 and uh, CD8 uh, T cell activation. And uh, by mass spec uh, analysis, we found out that MHC class 1 molecules are frequently presented on MHC class 2 molecules because they, in principle, route through all the compartments which are meant for MHC class 2 presentation. And we used the MHC class 1 molecule secretory domain and transmembrane tech and uh, fused this to, in this case, to antigens and uh, could uh, see in co-cultures with autologous human dendritic cells and T cells that we get uh, improved CD4 T cell present, uh, uh, activation and expansion, but at the same time even optimize uh, MHC class 1 uh, presentation and uh, CD8 T cell um, activation and expansion. And these were two important fields for us uh, to um, build a good foundation for our cancer immune therapy uh, platform. Another, uh, another important um, Observation, as I already pointed out, back in the day, uh, cancer vaccines uh, that were tested with all the other platforms were primarily subcutaneously and intraderminally administered peptides and protein and so on. And the idea was that dendritic cells uh, there would take up and transport uh, the antigen to the uh, to lymph nodes, uh, to the draining lymph nodes, because lymph nodes are the place where immune responses are induced profes by professional antigen-presenting cells. And we asked the question, why not bring mRNA directly into the uh, lymph node? And this uh, uh, is one of those experiments where mRNA, naked mRNA, so not formulated in any way, uh, was injected in mice lymph nodes. And as you can see here, uh, we, these are antigen-specific against the encoded antigen CD8 T-cells in this mouse system. Uh, we got a very strong uh, in, uh, proliferation of antigen-specific T-cells in the lymph node, but they also circulated uh, uh, and went into the, uh, into the spleen, so other lymphoid compartments, only if we were injecting intranodally, not near nodally, so you really needed to go into the lymph node, in particular as compared to the conventional routes of administration. This was, uh, this was um, uh, uh, better. Uh, and uh, we could see in those injected lymph nodes very strong proliferation not only of CD8 positive antigen-specific T cells, but also CD4 positive T, uh, T cells uh, due to those improvements in terms, uh, terms of presentation we had uh, to introduce. And as I said, this is naked mRNA. So uh, a couple of minutes after you have injected, you see the mRNA lying around, but not for long because of a ubiquitous RNA polymerases. However, there are cells which, uh, which accumulate the mRNA and start to, uh, to uh, express the encoded antigen. And these are 
uh, resident and professional antigen presenting cells, CDF, uh, CD11B or CD11C positive cells, which we found out later have a constitutional mechanism, namely macropinocytosis, to accumulate uh, the mRNA. So that uh, even this injection brought our mRNA exactly to the place where we want it to be. So we asked the question is if just injecting an mRNA into one lymph node gives us a pretty potent uh, T cell response, what would happen if we would basically mimic what is happening in nature uh, with a systemic virus in infection where all lymphatic compartments see the antigen to together with the right innate immune stimulatory response. What would happen if we would ensure that our mRNA would end up uh, in um, basically systemically in all, RNA, uh, in all compartments uh, of the immune system? And in order to achieve that, uh, we tested various liposomal and lipid and other formulations uh, in high throughput screens uh, one of the important aspects here was, and that goes to your question, we wanted to have something which was immunologically inert, which was not easy to achieve, because we wanted to fully leverage the very distinct immune stimulatory uh, uh, capacity of uh, uridine mRNA and its intrinsic adjuvant effect. And uh, as you can see here, this is a dotma uh, formulated um, uh, lipopolyplex mRNA formulation, uh, which was interesting at that time because these were GMP for these uh, uh, formulations. There were GMP processes already available. Uh, and when we administered uh, this formulation uh, and titled it from a cationic to near um, uh, um, a neutral uh, charge, we saw that all of a sudden uh, the targeting and the expression switched from lung here to the place where we wanted it to be, namely into the spleen, which is the largest uh, lymphoid compartment, uh, not only to the spleen, but also to the lymph nodes and to the bone marrow of these mice. And we lost expression in the moment when we depleted these mice systemically from CD11 positive antigen uh, um, a professional antigen presenting uh, cells. And um, uh, what happened actually in those um, lymphatic compartments, and this is the spleen, was exactly what one would see with um, uh, immune response uh, upon uh, virus infection. The RNA was taken up here in the spleen by CD11C positive uh, dendritic cells in the marginal zone, and the CD11C dendritic cells would enter, would migrate, would enter the white pulp, uh, pulp uh, and uh, express uh, the antigen uh, there. And um, the, uh, it, it was in particular the, the, um, uh, dendritic, the resident dendritic cells, but also plasmocytoid dendritic cells, which were taking up the mRNA. And this uptake, because of the at um, intrinsic adjuvanticity of mRNA, also did something to um, uh, the dendritic cell cells, namely induced potent maturation. And uh, we could see the discrete uh, innate immune response, the a signature of cytokines dominated by type 1 interferon, uh, interferon, but also other pro-inflammatory cytokines. And in mouse models, exactly this combination of showing the antigen robustly and the innate immune response uh, triggers potent um, uh, uh, T cell responses against specific antigen, uh, uh, antigens, uh, polyfunctional ones. Uh, and um, this in different systems, and uh, this uh, um, uh, allowed us to treat difficult to treat uh, mouse models. So what about translating this into the clinical setting, uh, this new targeting mechanism? Uh, we started with um, um, a, a difficult to address uh, a challenge in um, uh, cancer vaccinology, namely 
uh, with tumor-associated antigens, which are not mute mutated, but are just expressed because they are cancer germline antigens, for example, in a tumor-associated way, where uh, uh, the thinking is that there is immune tolerance, which you have to break, That's, which means you need re really a potent immune response. And these are four melanoma-associated antigens, which cumulatively are expressed in uh, more than 95% of melanoma patients. We combined them, and uh, th this was used as an off-the-shelf vaccine. We treated uh, patients with advanced melanoma, and uh, the uh, observations we made um, basically phenocopied what we saw in mice, namely uh, shortly after vaccination, we sh saw strong metabolic activity uh, in lymphoid compartments here in the spleen by PET uh, CT. Uh, this is a patient who, was, uh, um, uh, who got weekly injections of our M mRNA with increasing amounts of mRNA. And you can see here, we go up to 100 microgram also in our current clinical trials. So this is, um, the reactogenicity is well manageable and the safety profile uh, is fine uh, at these dose ranges. What you, however, can see at, in this patient is the induction of the innate immune signature dominated by type 1 interferon uh, is uh, dose-dependent, MR, uh, mRNA lipopex dose-dependent, is pulsatile, goes back to normal within uh, 24 hours, and is elevated but not supraphysiological, which this means that in this dose range we don't observe any clinical cytokine uh, release symptoms. And uh, this uh, was uh, an observation which was very encouraging for us. This patient here developed multiple immune responses against multiple epitopes across these targets uh, presented on their HLA, class 1, class 2 mo molecules, and this is only one of them directed against one NYE, so one epitope. And as you can see here, from zero, we were able to expand circulating CD8 positive cells, and 10% of this patient's circulating CD8s are directed against this epitope uh, alone. So we get what we need uh, to achieve, namely strong expansion of T cells in the range which you normally would get by adoptive T cell uh, transfer. And this is one example uh, of a patient who uh, was not responsive to PEMRO, uh, uh, check anti-PD-1 uh, inhibitor, uh, and uh, was then uh, uh, receiving vaccine on top. Uh, and as you can see, the combination of both resulted in uh, regression of uh, lymph node uh, of, um, uh, uh, of lung metastasis. This is a trial which was conducted in heavily pre-treated patients with metastatic disease who were checkpoint blockade experience and were not responding to that anymore. And we tested um, our um, uh, vaccine uh, in combination and also alone in these patients uh, and uh, saw in this advanced patient population um, uh, 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 tumor shrinkage uh, of, uh, of uh, uh, considerable duration in several of these patients. So um, one way to address cancer, one way to address cancer by vaccination are tumor-associated antigens. Another way is using cancer mutations where you do not expect immune tolerance because these are de novo antigens. And if the mutation is such that all of a sudden uh, a sequence becomes a, an epitope re presented on this patient's MHC class 1 or class 2 molecules. You can use it as a vaccine, and Eckhart uh, has already eloquently described this methodology. Um, we um, conducted our first, and this is the very first one, individualized cancer vaccine trial uh, starting in 2013. Uh, and uh, in this specific trial, we treated melanoma patients with advanced melanoma. Uh, and this trial was the intranodal, non-formulated uh, uh, RNA type uh, of uh, vaccination. We had to go high with the doses, 500,000 micrograms injected into lymph nodes. What we got uh, were unprecedented immune responses 
in these uh, melanoma patients, both CD4 and uh, CD8 responses in a large fraction of patients. And what was in particular interesting for us was these are melanoma patients with recurrences prior vaccination. And uh, this is uh, the number of recurrences after starting vaccination, uh, uh, repeated vaccinations with, an in with this individualized vaccine in a unique composition prepared for each and every patient. Uh, in a race against that patient's tumor, so you have to be quick. And as you can see here, we get a, a reduction, a significant reduction of the cumulative re uh, recurrence rate in uh, these patients. Uh, uh, another study uh, has been conducted in pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma, this time in the adjuvant setting, so after the pancreatic cancer was removed, the vaccine and the standard of care chemotherapy was uh, administered. And um, uh, we just recently reported this uh, small study. We got immune responses strong, high magnitude immune responses in half of these patients. And those patients who had immune responses were the ones uh, who still do not have a progression. This is a high risk population, whereas those uh, who uh, did not respond uh, to the, their individualized vaccine uh, have uh, experienced the expected uh, um, uh, re relapses yet uh, already. So uh, with this observation that we can uh, use mRNA to basically mimic what happens in an um, infection with a virus and the, po po uh, the, the, the potential to activate the immune system efficiently. If, if we can use mRNA for that, can we also use mRNA to mimic a natural mechanism to induce immune to tolerance? That means uh, to develop a vaccine which does not induce immunity, but tolerizes in the autoimmune setting. And, um, we have done that in nature, the way you induce immune tolerance. One contributing factor is that you present the antigen at the professional site, namely in lymphatic tissues, but without the intrinsic adjuvanticity, without that innate immune uh, uh, signature. Uh, that means under non-inflammatory conditions. And we ask the question, why don't we combine uh, the mRNA, uh, our LPX technology and delivery systemically with uh, non-inflammatory mRNA, and uh, Eckhart has already um, uh, talked about that. So, uh, so pseudomethyluridin um, um, uh, mRNA, and when administering uh, this to uh, mice, you can clearly see. Whereas with uh, uridin mRNA which the platform we use in cancer I talked about a couple of minutes ago, we get dendritic cell activation, we get um, interferon alpha systemically, we activate all the other uh, um, cell types. We do not get this in this context with pseudomethyluridin mRNA. Um, and then we went into an experimental system for mouse system uh, for multiple sclerosis, experimental autoimmune encephalomyelitis, where you have a mock antigen, which is a myelin antigen against which you get a CD, uh, uh, Th1 and Th17 autoreactive T cells. And by administering this vaccine, uh, we could prevent and uh, mitigate uh, uh, progressive um, uh, EAE. Uh, we saw that we could um, uh, minimize, uh, in particular, um, T cells, uh, CD4 positive T cells, which were specific for the autoantigen uh, mock uh, by uh, 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 non inflammatory mRNA demyelinization. Uh, was prevented, and the mechanism which we then uncovered was that in this context, mRNA induces, mRNA lipoplexes induce the activation of a specific, antigen specific regulatory T cell uh, 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 um, uh, subset of cells which keep um, Th1 and Th17 autoreactive CD4 cells at bay. So uh, with this, uh, I hope I uh, could show you that also from an 
immunology perspective, mRNA uh, is so interesting for us because it is actually a toolbox which context-dependently can be used for different purposes. We are doing this, we are using mRNA for different purposes. We are agnostic, which chemistry and which format and which nanoparticles we use depending on the purpose we want to use it for. With this, I would like to acknowledge all the people who were in involved over the last three decades, actually, and would like to thank you for your interest. Thank you for this fantastic talk. Uh, I think the pancreatic uh, the cancer vaccine results are super exciting. You talked about this tolerizing uh, sort of mRNA strategy, but that's with the pseudo-U modification, but that is currently being used for the COVID vaccine. So can you talk about how to translate that concept uh, into human for the tolerizing vaccine? Uh, yes, yeah, yeah. so, so this basically shows that uh, we should be very agnostic. Uh, there is this discussion, which of the mRNA chemistries is better? Uh, I don't think that we can see it in this binary way. It's really about the context, uh, and um, this context here makes sense immunologically. We are bringing the antigen without inflammation to those places where the dendritic cells have to decide whether it goes uh, uh, towards toler tolerance or, or, or immunity. And, uh, that's one way to use um, a nucleoside modified mRNA, and we are thinking of ways to bring this now also into the clinical setting. Um, we are using um, nucleoside modified mRNA, also we at BioNTech, uh, for COVID-19 vaccines, and it works perfectly, it works great. And the reason for this is uh, that we have a lipid nanoparticle which comes with its own uh, with its own, in, in principle, innate immune stimulatory um, uh, pattern, which is a very distinct one. It's not the same which you get with uridin mRNA, and it's good this way because the pattern of cytokine signatures you get in the lymph nodes is, is different. You get a bit of IL-21, which helps, helps with the B cells, but you also have some uh, uh, activation of CD4 and CD8 T cells. Not as well the latter one, which one would probably see with an mRNA lipoplex vaccine, but we do not need that for a preventive approach. So it's really about understanding, and it's, this is a continuum, how you combine what, how you pur purify double-stranded RNA, that's also a factor out or not, uh, to um, serve the different purposes. As, as I'd worry it's not just about the formulation, but about individual patients, right? So like with the MOG study, um, you know, in some patients you might be driving, um, you know, T effector versus T, T suppressor, so T reg. So, I mean, until you actually get to clinical trials in large numbers, you, it, it may be more than the formulation or a different formulation for a different clinical subpopulation, it, but it, then you'd have to profile that. It, it, absolutely. Yeah. So, so um, we are not rushing into clinic yeah, with, yeah, yeah. with this. We really need to understand, and this, this is less about mRNA, it's more about immunology and the mechanism of the disease, to understand uh, what is multiple sclerosis about. And multiple sclerosis is a huge basket of, yeah. of different uh, sub diseases with different immunological mechanisms, also with different antigens, so we might even need a personalized approach uh, because uh, patients have uh, uh, autoreactivities against uh, different types of myelin, uh, myelin antigens. Right, right. So, uh, so we need first to understand that. So mechanism research comes before yeah, using very, mRNA very technology. Good, very good caution. Yes, uh, over here, and then we'll come here. Yeah. Um, me. Um, so, the slide you showed with uh, melanoma, where melanomas that were not responsive to PD-1, and then when you added the, the antigen specific stimulation, they were, is that the way you think Keytruda ultimately will work uh, on everybody by giving them both 
at the same time. Is that what you were saying, and are you thinking that? Uh, yes, so, so we can improve, uh, we believe that we can improve the, the benefit from anti-PD-1 uh, um, uh, uh, drugs uh, by combining them with vaccination, which will not be the answer for everything, but it's a mechanism. So what, what is actually happening is that anti-PD-1 compounds, Pembro and Vivo, they activate those cells which are already there, those T cell specificities which are already there and have breaks on them, and this break is released. However, the, um, uh, the mechanism by which spontaneously T cell responses are induced in a cancer patient against the ento entire plethora of neoantigens, which are princip in principle there, is very poor, so you, the immune system is blind and does not even raise those T cells to be blocked and then de-blocked. So what the vaccine does is that it creates a new population of de novo T cells and the checkpoint inhibitors can now work on those. That's also the reason why in those patients who do not respond to checkpoint in inhibitors anymore, we can reposition the checkpoint inhibitors now on the new T cells. Very good. Okay, last question here. Yeah. yeah so, a really fantastic talk. So, my question is actually, you know, all these neo antigens, there may be possible the T leg cells, they can recognize the neo antigen as well. So, in this case, you may be uh, supply, you know, when you vaccine with a neo antigen combined with anti CTLA4. This actually, you know, specifically express on T leg, so maybe increase the efficacy of your, you know, uh, immunity. Absolutely, the anti-CTLA4 combination. I mean, for every immunologist, that's the favorite molecule, isn't it? Uh, that that's one of the combinations we want to test. We just teamed up with a company which is developing an anti-CTLA4 which is safer because, you know, EP uh, has um, uh, uh, quite an uh, adverse event profile uh, and we want to have something which we can give longer. Uh, so that's absol absolutely a very interesting combination for us. Very good. All right, we'll stop there. Aslam, thank you so much. So as, you, as you've already heard, so for mRNA therapeutics, the drug is not the mRNA, it's the mRNA you know, in concert with the, with the liquid, lipid nanoparticle. And uh, remember back in the day, the way we would try to get nucleic acids in the cells was electroporation? I mean, people still do that, but it's, it's such a vandalized way to attack a cell with, with what you want. But then came lipofaction. And I'm not sure people are aware, but the, but the first person to combine cationic lipids and nucleic acids to do so-called lipofaction is Phil Felger. Uh, Phil then went on to found the company Vical uh, and was CSO at Vical for many years. Vical's goal was DNA vaccines uh, within, lipid, within lipid particles. Uh, after a very successful run at Vical in, I think, 2002, Phil, uh, Phil went back to academia, uh, uh, joined uh, faculty at UC Irvine, and to this day he's the director of the Center for Vaccine Research and Development at UC Irvine. Oh, well. Uh... Uh, thank you for the invitation to come here. <laughs> uh, this is a very special group. This is the RNA group. And uh, to be invited to come to the RNA group and uh, talk about the lipid nanoparticles now that uh, seems to have, uh, be, there's a marriage uh, in these uh, two communities. Uh, also, I want to thank uh, Oslin for an amazing uh, talk, showing us so much data to allow us to actually keep thinking forward. You know, it's amazing. Thank you. So, um, I uh, found that the title uh, matches the, the RNA uh, title, uh, Past, Present, and Future. And uh, I, I, sometimes I call this lecture 150 Years of Vaccine Science. And uh, the reason I got interested in looking up what the history was, was because we were working during the COVID outbreak with um, uh, uh, actually active uh, study in COVID 
uh, serology and understanding the, the, the development of uh, the COVID and outbreak as it was moving through Orange County. So it, it got into the news media, and, and a lot of people were asking us these questions. I know you've, you've uh, come across these kind of questions before. Is the mRNA lipid nanoparticle vaccine safe? And uh, of course we said yes. We've been working on it for 35 years. We've used it in humans, and it's been completely safe. And then the next obvious question was, if you've been working on it for 35 years, why did it take so long? And, and uh, <clears throat> I, I didn't have an answer, so, <laughs> so, you know, like a good scientist, when we don't have an answer, we, we try to find out what the answer is. Uh, so I, I got this amazing, uh, beautiful book, if you're interested in this topic. Uh, it was copyrighted in 1926, when, you know, uh, right after the Robert uh, Koch and uh, Pasteur period that uh, really, where they developed all of the vaccine technology that we still use today. We don't do anything new, except until a couple years ago, we're finally doing something new. Uh, and uh, ha have uh, some items on the outline here that we can go through. So I, I, I got a, a little PowerPoint deck and thought I would ask Stanley Plotkin, who's uh, 90 years old, and he lived the, the vaccine uh, history uh, for in, in our last uh, century. And um, I sent this slide deck to him, and he said, uh, I hope you will forgive me for saying that I think your analysis is oversimplified. <laughs> and, uh, and then he, he sent me 150 slides in uh, two s slide decks, and went through all 49 of the vaccines that, and and a little history about each one. And uh, guess what? Number 50 is not on here, and that's the mRNA vaccines. So uh, I, I I will show a few timeline things from uh, my talk. Um, and showing sort of how adopting scientific discovery takes time. Uh, this is the timeline uh, of the smallpox vaccine. You know, it, it was uh, used actually thousands of years ago in a process called variolation, where you would scratch a person who had smallpox and apply that scratch to a person who didn't and that person would get vaccinated. They actually had data that proved that that worked. Uh, but Jenner, we all know about Jenner, he discovered the, the cowpox uh, version of the smallpox vaccine. <clears throat> that was discovered in 1780, but it took 100 years uh, before it was deployed. And uh, so we were doing pretty good with 35 years uh, of uh, the time <coughs> compared to that. What was holding it up? It was uh, manufacturing. You know, people <coughs> um, uh, had uh, uh, challenges to do manufacturing. They had to uh, develop something called a vaccine farm that had a lot of infected cows, and uh, they harvested the pus from the cows, and they developed a very sophisticated uh, purification process. They centrifuged it, and everything that was in the bottom of the centrifuge they threw away, and what was it, everything that was in the supernate and they kept, and that was the vaccine. And uh, um, <coughs> the, uh, by, by uh, the 1880s or so, they were able to produce enough vaccine so that every person in the world could be vaccinated with that vaccine and eradicate <coughs> the uh, smallpox from their planet. So um, modern scientific method has kind of a different timeline. Uh, people were not understanding microbes. They were still puzzling with spontaneous generation. It, it wasn't until Pasteur and Koch came along that they linked up microbes to certain uh, infections. And at the same time, they developed vaccine technology 
to uh, uh, produce an immune response to, to uh, inhibit those, those agents. They did all of the basic science for vaccine science right there. And everything that we do today uh, until a few years ago uh, uses the same basic uh, ideas. You kill the bacteria and you inject the bacteria or the virus in, in the person and uh, a lot of times you get protection. The other thing, uh, so, so uh, the, the other thing that slows progress down is convincing lay uh, people and communities. It takes time. I remember in 1992, I saw the announcement on television when Pope Paul II vindicated Galileo for heresy 350 uh, years earlier. You know, that's just another uh, thing, you know, now more popular we hear about the anti-vaxxers, about the mRNA, but there were anti-vaxxers also uh, it, that uh, during the, the, uh, the, the smallpox uh, vaccination period, you can see what kinds of uh, statements the, the, those uh, people were putting into the, the press. But uh, after they made those announcements, a few years later, the smallpox was eradicated from the earth. <clears throat> So um, some of the foundations of more modern uh, vaccine science. Uh, I, I already uh, mentioned Pasteur and Koch here uh, and their contributions. And uh, I, I was, uh, I'm old enough to have remembered the excitement of the Salk uh, polio vaccine and, uh, and all of the vaccines that Maurice Hilleman uh, introduced. Uh, I guess one of my mentors is uh, Alec Bangham, who was a liposome scientist, uh, uh, very devoted to this uh, field. Uh, and then uh, Tom Thompson uh, was my mentor, postdoc mentor in Charlottesville, Virginia. Then I, I learned uh, uh, immunology from Tony Allison at uh, Syntex, and I was very uh, pleased and uh, thrilled that I could uh, collaborate with uh, Maurice Hilleman uh, while he was at Merck. And I'll, I'll uh, uh, describe a little bit of that later. So in, in Tom's lab, what we were doing was understanding exactly what a lipid bilayer is and what the uh, organization of the lipid molecules down to the fraction of an angstrom and uh, all the fluid, fluid properties and how lipid uh, bilayers come together. We knew what the <clears throat> molecular weight of a liposome was based on its uh, diameter. <clears throat> uh, we also understood that uh, lipid molecules take different shapes, and the shape of the lipid molecule determines the, na the kind of nanoparticle that you end up with. Uh, so you can get cone-shaped uh, molecules that form micelles. Uh, cylindrical uh, lipids always form stable bilayers. And then there is another <coughs> interesting structure. Inverted cone forms as inverted micelle, and there was this, it, it turns out there's exactly enough space for a DNA strand or an RNA strand to fit in the middle of this this uh, structure here. So um, in, in Tom's lab, we, we were studying uh, lipids that we had available. There were uh, neutral lipids that you could get in na from nature and negatively charged lipids, but there's no positively charged uh, lipids. Uh, we had all the discussion about evolution this morning. I think there might be some evolutionary reason why the positively charged lipids were excluded from e evolution. But you can't find uh, positively charged uh, lipid bilayer forming lipids. So knowing that, uh, when I went to Syntex, I asked the chemist to make uh, some lipids like that. And uh, this is one uh, uh, Dotma. We, Aslam, uh, mentioned, it, mentioned this, this lipid. So we had a lot of ideas about what to use and how to help uh, drug delivery. <clears throat> but one of the things that was 
real uh, hot topic then was the uh, <clears throat> Uh, gene, gene therapy. Uh, people were making uh, viruses, and modify, they were able to make recombinant viruses to use the viruses to deliver genes. And we thought, well, maybe we could uh, make an artificial synthetic a virus particle with uh, a liposome. So uh, uh, scientists did this, uh, and this is a si actual drawn to scale, this is the size of a liposome. And this is the size of a DNA. <clears throat> so there was a problem getting this big, this long uh, piece of DNA inside this uh, small space. And it uh, seems like a simple problem. We thought if we had positively charged liposomes, we would get, they would obviously go together. They were so positive, one was so positively charged, the other so negatively charged, they would uh, glutinate and we'd see an aggregate. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> the surprise, there's a series of surprises coming here. Uh, it didn't aggregate, and my first thought was that they didn't interact for some reason, uh, but that didn't seem possible. You could use a sucrose density gradient, though, and you could make all the DNA float. Uh, and so, obviously, they were, were, were able to interact. But these were the first uh, lipid nanoparticles. They weren't just an aggregate, they, they, they changed their shape, the DNA and the lipid changed their shape to accommodate each other and form uh, lipid nanoparticles spontaneously, a self-assembling uh, system. So the next surprise was that these things, uh, you know, I, I thought we were gonna have to put a lot of sophisticated targeting molecules on these things to make them work like viruses, but the next surprise was that they worked right away just by mixing the DNA uh, together uh, with the liposome. And you get, this is a green fluorescent protein uh, expression here. And then the next surprise was how popular th this uh, reagent became as a transfection reagent for laboratory scientists. And uh, this re uh, reagent cells more than $300 million a year of product, and it's been doing that for, for 30 years. I've tried to add up uh, the total value of uh, commercial products, and this is uh, up there among uh, some of the highest uh, value uh, commercial products. So uh, this is the lab book entry in 1984, uh, the DOTMA synthesis, and this is uh, Rick Roman, uh, the, the the fellow who did the synthesis. So um, then here we were in a pharmaceutical company and I thought, uh, obviously, you do something in cell culture, it's working, next thing you're gonna do is uh, see what you can do in vivo. So uh, you have to get approval for something like that from the company. And uh, I, I sent the protocol up uh, for approval, waiting for them to give us approval to do the study. And that's when surprise four happened and management said, no, we can't support it. Gene therapy is for the year 2020. <laughs> <laughs> they, were, they were right, I, you know. <laughs> I, I was, I can imagine me because I, I think about that quote every day, you know, for, for uh, 30 years. And I was watching the calendar as the FDA approval was, was happening. And uh, I got, I, I had the nicest call with Hardy Chan uh, after the approval. <laughs> uh, so, we couldn't do it at Syntex, so I, I started up a company called Vical uh, in San Diego with some faculty members uh, at, on, on the faculty at uh, uh, UCSD. And then the next surprise happened. We, we had these, uh, these uh, things that were working in cultured cells, and we injected them into animal. This is my uh, colleague, John Wolf, at uh, Wisconsin. And we could uh, see beautiful expression in, uh, in mouse muscle tissue, the tissue that we use for all of our immunizations uh, today. <clears throat> this is uh, beta-galactosidase expression uh, in the muscle. 
unfortunately, John uh, passed away in April of 2020, so he didn't, he didn't get to see the uh, results of this work. Uh, another thing that was happening uh, around the same time is uh, Don Milton was making uh, functional mRNA. He could show that it would, uh, of course, it would express protein in, in, a, in, in a cell-free system, but he could inject the uh, RNA into large cells or oocytes and show that it was functional inside of a cell. Uh, we, we found that we could tr use the the lipofectin to, to get it into cells. So you, just as well as using mRNA, uh, DNA, you can do, do also mRNA. Uh, uh, so Merck and company and Maurice Hilleman, seeing this, uh, decided to license the technology uh, at, at Merck. And I work with, I still work with Jeff Ulmer. Uh, and, um, we, we did an experiment in 1993 showing that uh, the nucleocapsid protein from flu, we could get a, a, a nice antibody response after injecting it uh, into mice. And then that immune response that we generated was able to protect the mice from uh, infection. Maurice's quote is, this is one of the most exciting things in modern vaccinology. Took time, didn't it? This is 1993, <laughs> uh, and finally we're we're able to take advantage of it today. <laughs> uh, it was hard to get uh, expression in primates and humans with the technology that we had, and that's 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 the explanation. So uh, there were technology advances that really improved the delivery and expression, and that's why where we are today. I'll show you a little bit more about that. So uh, it, in my lab, uh, during the, the two, beginning uh, 2002, uh, we were developing a technology for protein, making mo protein microarrays. And I won't be talking about this much, but um, the, uh, we, we've made thousands of proteins and made hundreds of thousands of uh, protein microarrays now and probed as many samples. Uh, this work, uh, the results from this work, uh, example of the data is shown here. This is something we called the Prometheus Array that DARPA funded. And we have a, a pr bunch of different proteins on here derived from different viruses. The common cold, CoV, flu, adenovirus, um, metanumovirus, parainfluenza virus, and RSV. And we're measuring the antibody uh, that people have. So a thousand people were in this study, and, and almost everybody has antibodies to all of these different viruses. But guess what? This was in 2018. Nobody had any antibody to uh, 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 SARS-CoV-2. So we, we made array, an array at the beginning of the outbreak, and this is what the array looks like, and it has SARS-CoV-2 antigens on it. And uh, we did a great big study that had 10,000 people in it from Orange County. Every, the whole campus was shut down, but our lab was, was still um, active. We were following uh, Im herd immunity in the population. And then we had the, a great experience to observe the, the effect of the vaccine when it was introduced. So over a year in some of the hotspots, uh, in Orange County, we got up to 36% of the population in a year. But in, it, with the vaccine, within a month after the vaccine is administered, you get uh, herd, this kind of herd immunity, that kind of protection. And it, and it goes uh, even beyond that. The, the, this is the kind of profile, <coughs> antibody profile, you get <coughs> from um, uh, infection. But the vaccine is much more potent than even infection and inducing uh, immunity. And this is just another way of showing this beautiful study that we did. There's 5,000 specimens shown here. You can see the, herd, the natural herd immunity and the herd immunity induced by the vaccine to the, to the left there. And these are some of the people 
uh, they were the the students didn't have anything to do because the campus was closed, and so they they went out collecting these samples uh, in drive-through uh, tended areas. And so what I've I've uh, I've told you a little bit about then is things that went on uh, in this period, and then uh, these are certain events, and we got up to the point of uh, proposing a structure for the lipid nanoparticle. So what's happening in the 151st year? <coughs> um, this is uh, just as fascinating as the previous uh, uh, data. Uh, I, to, to get a, a perspective <coughs> on this, um, I used the, the publications on lipid nanoparticles, uh, the progression from uh, 2007 till now. And uh, you can see this increase that happened here in 2018. That's when alnylam uh, uh, got their uh, lipid nanoparticle product, uh, siRNA product, approved. Um, I'm, I'm sure Phil uh, Sharp is going to tell us more about that. But uh, these are uh, other key people that I worked with during this time. Ian McLaughlin came to my lab. Uh, uh, and uh, Peter Cullis, a long-term time uh, collaborator. And the, we're, we've already learned that there's so many more applications, not just vaccinations. So if, for those of you who haven't seen what the, you've been vaccinated with, uh, this is uh, a, a picture I took of a lipid vesicle uh, in 1978, a beautiful, I considered this a beautiful picture. Uh, this is uh, so striking. Uh, this is what the mRNA lipid nanoparticles look like now. And they're not empty, they're just packed, completely packed with uh, dense, uh, uh, densely, there's not even room for water in there. So, yeah. <coughs> and it's some kind of structure like this. And uh, after this meeting, I'm going to do a lot of cryo EM. Uh, uh, to figure out if I, we can get some support, uh, experimental support for this, this structure. I think it's probably going to be uh, have some similarity to what it actually is. The current, uh, this, is a, this is a terrible uh, cartoon, but it does show that uh, it's composed of a lot of different uh, components, uh, ionizable lipid, cholesterol, helper lipid, and PEG lipids. And uh, I, another point I want to make is that uh, this technology can enable the world, and I think Oslim is, is wants to point that out too, that you know, we're all here to learn. And this platform is perfect for that. Anybody can bring, the, bring this technology into your own lab. It's not that complicated to do. And uh, all of these lipids are, are, are the lipids that are in the Moderna and the, the Pfizer. They're available commercially you know, to do your research. Uh, uh, more lipids, and there's a, there's a, a technique, it, they make it look complicated here, but it's actually very simple, it's just uh, ethanol, uh, lipids in ethanol, and RNA in a buffer, you put the, mix them together at a T-junction, and then you dialyze away the ethanol, and you have lipid nanoparticles, just like what I showed, and just like you've been getting vaccinated with. Um, uh, in uh, laboratory doing this, uh, we have uh, certain equipment, particle sizing equipment for uh, measuring the quality of the product, the zeta potential, encapsulation efficiency, expression. Uh, this is what one experiment would look like. You have a, a bunch of different formulations, and uh, you make them and characterize their physical properties, and then measure their ability to induce an immune response and see if the uh, antibodies you induce can neutralize the virus. Uh, this is uh, some more studies like this. Uh, I think the key thing on this slide I want to point out, I think Oslam also brought up uh, some, uh, some issues like this, that unmodified spike mRNA induces a nice uh, uh, immune response. And methyl pseudouridine uh, modified RNA also produces a nice uh, immune response. But when we use uh, methoxy modified uh, spike, uh, we don't uh, get an Im a good immune response. So if you want to get an immune response, there's 
there's a M mRNA that will induce that, and if you don't want it for gene therapy applications, you can do that too. Uh, and this is just to uh, finish up this, that uh, the immune response induced uh, uh, confers uh, protection. Uh, so I just have a few final uh, pic pictorial slides here. We've used this uh, uh, mouse, the, the, uh, uh, the, the TD tomato uh, mouse that has, uh, has the uh, red fluorescent protein expressed in all of its cells, but there's a stop code on preventing expression. If you can uh, deliver a Cree uh, mRNA, the Cree will uh, remove the stop code on and uh, the uh, red fluorescent protein will be expressed. This is what uh, liver, control liver looks like. There, there's uh, some DAPI stain in here and some background green fluorescent protein. This is what it looks like after you administer uh, Cree uh, uh, LNP uh, to, in the liver. Every cell has been edited in this uh, mouse. Uh, this is a close-up. It's uh, stunning how much uh, expressions occurred. It's a dose-dependent effect, so at a low dose you get uh, a conversion but not as extensive. Uh, there's expression in the kidney, kidney. I think there's a different cell type uh, uh, being expressed here. This might be a resident uh, macrophages. And uh, we're, uh, it, it, it's just incredible to me that we can go all over the animal and, and now uh, deliver uh, functional genes and express them. This is a local expression in the brain. This is in the retina. Uh, and uh, there's uh, gene editing work on, going on uh, with Chris Balczewski at our institute. And skin, I'm looking forward to some in injecting some hedgehog uh, uh, into the skin because it, it uh, stimulates hair growth. <laughs> <coughs> and and the, final, the final data slide is, is this one, uh, Emily. Uh, was here, uh, at, uh, showed her poster, and uh, uh, Aslam had uh, much more extensive pictures than this, but uh, locally in the muscle we see uh, these cells that are probably macrophages and dendritic cells, and uh, they can, by flow cytometry, they can analyze the, the, the exact uh, uh, type of cell that's uh, being uh, targeted. So we've, we've already heard about uh, many different applications of the technology now. I don't think I need to go through that anymore. Uh, this is the team that was working during the, the outbreak uh, when the whole campus was closed. That's Emily back there. And then I leave the last word to Stanley. And uh, th this expresses the way I feel about all of this, that say all you want about the horrors of last years, we've accomplished more than I would have imagined possible. It's astounding, it's thrilling. I was about to say it's miraculous, but that's not right. I don't believe in miracles. I might sound a little fancy, but I believe in science. I believe in our capacity to endure and overcome. So thank you. <laughs> nice, thank you. We have time for a couple questions. Yep, back here. Um, so we heard from Eckert a little bit about how once these lipid nanoparticles are in the bloodstream, how they can be trafficked to specific tissues, but for instance with these intramuscular injections with the vaccines, how do those get into the bloodstream as intact nanoparticles? Right now, uh, we would, we would uh, be thinking about uh, picking your route of injection, you know, because if you want, if you really want to go into the bloodstream, you can go intravenously. And in that situation, we, the bulk of the dose gets into the, the liver and the kidney. So if, if, if the, the target is the, is the liver, that the way to go is to do an intravenous 
injection. I, I, I don't think that the, the dose uh, is, the bulk of the dose is getting into the, the intravenous system after an intramuscular injection. Our interest is getting the dose into the draining lymph node. Yeah. Anyone else? One more? All right, uh, Tom, are we back at 11? Is that what you want? Uh, 11.05. 11.05. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. <laughs> so th this morning, I hope you share my impression. I thought it was thrilling. I thought we were really in a special place to be able to, to hear the three talks this morning. And we're gonna continue that energy with part two of the world of RNA medicine. Jim Dahlberg is a terrific RNA scientist who has done important work on nuclear export of RNAs, how that ties into RNA processing uh, in his work at the University of Wisconsin-Madison uh, with his wife. Uh, Elsbeth Lund, who unfortunately wasn't able to join us today, but we do have Jim, and he will introduce the, the session. Okay, well, um, this morning, as Tom said, it was a fantastic session this morning, and uh, it dealt mainly with vaccines and, and the delivery. And what we're going to hear about now is a different kind of application of the RNA world, not with vaccines, but with um, non-coding RNAs of, of various sorts. And I think um, we're in for a real treat. Three wonderful speakers. Hmm? Um, Phil Sharp, who I don't think needs, well, no, none of these people needs an introduction. Uh, Phil uh, was involved in the discovery of introns in messenger RNAs and more recently has been working on transcription and um, microRNAs, siRNAs, and so forth. Uh, Howard Chang has been working on uh, uh, circular RNAs and um, long non-coding RNAs and did some of the fundam fundamental work in uh, really establishing the importance of, of, of uh, those RNAs and Eric Olson is um, going to tell us how this can be applied or some, some of the technology that can be applied uh, to working with, uh, in cardiac uh, and uh, other kind of muscle uh, problems. And so we're in, uh, in for a real treat. So, Phil. Thank you. Um, uh, as Tom had said, it is really exciting to be part of this session, and thank you so much for inviting me. 60 years after the discovery of splicing, actually 60, not splicing, mRNA, it's become a therapeutic. <laughs> and I think we've just scratched the surface of RNA biology's contribution to uh, our um, uh, therapeutic modalities. So uh, if you think about RNA biology as a therapeutic, you can think about it targeting a catalyst, targeting uh, RNA as a target in splicing or transcription. RNA is a therapeutic, and we heard this morning about it as a RNA, and that RNA can be linear or circular, and then RNA as small interfering RNAs. And then RNA is a regulatory factor. And uh, many of these are just emerging over the last 10 or 20 years, and I think this list is going to expand enormously. I'm going to talk about Anilum and the work done by Anilum is started by David Bartel, Tom Tushel, Phil Zamor, Phil, Paul Schimmel, and myself in 2002. And all the work I'm going to mention about siRNA is a product of the, of the company's science. The company has published over 200 papers describing the progression from 2002 to now. To think about delivery of siRNA, uh, you have to solve a number of problems. One's effective delivery, the next is engineering features for stability, specificity, immunity, to reduce innate immunity, 
and then uh, effective deliveries to various other tissues. Uh, each of these is a product of the immune system, and we heard a lot about uh, delivery this morning, and that was really uh, quite exciting. But the thing that interested me when siRNA or RNA interference was first discovered was that one could design a drug based on a DNA sequence, and in 2002, we had the DNA sequence of the genome, and that could be used to, as a therapeutic modality. And we had a professional system in the cell to actually use that small RNA. It was the microRNA pathway. So if you could exploit delivery and other steps in this process, you could think about having a modality to treat disease in any tissue. The first issue is the one we heard this morning. It was uh, pioneered by many in this session. And uh, it's lipid nanoparticles entering the cell. We found that APOE was a critical component in that delivery to hepatocytes. It goes into the cell in the vesicle, which is acidified. It's a, a, a cationic structure with a certain PK, and you get a, a lipid transformation. By systematically varying the PK of that lipid, uh, we were able to optimize delivery uh, and uh, affecting us at 6.4, you got optimal delivery in animal kidney, uh, liver, sorry. And that increased the efficiency in our system by 100-fold. Now, that 100-fold is very significant because these lipid nanoparticles, when they enter the bloodstream, activate an innate complement-type system and produce a side effect. That makes it very uncomfortable for patients. And therefore, reduction in dose increases specificity, increases and suppresses off-target effects, and was a, a very important uh, advance. But delivery of siRNA through infusion IV means you have to take a patient into a clinical setting, do an IV delivery, and then uh, have treatment and return to that setting. A sub-Q injection, which you could possibly deliver yourself, just like an insulin injection, is a much more uh, patient-friendly means of delivery of these siRNAs. And therefore, the company um, uh, set out to de develop a uh, delivery system that could be administered sub-Q. In this system, the siRNA is covalently attached to a Galnac uh, head. It had been known that hepatocytes have the Galnac receptor on their uh, surface. It's uh, internalized. And if these RNAs are tagged with the Galnac receptor, you get them internally in the vesicle. The vesicle will leak in some way, releasing these RNAs in the cytoplasm. And they will then, the siRNA, if it's complementary, will cleave the messenger RNA. But this requires that uh, siRNA to be exposed to the blood and body fluids for a significant period of time, and therefore you have to stabilize those siRNAs to be able to effectively uh, deliver them. So that required stabilization chemistry, and uh, the original chemistry is illustrated here, and its uh, stability in, uh, is shown here in the, in the blood. But if you stabilize it in specific ways, you actually extend the stability in the blood, you get uptake, and you get much more uh, extended silencing. And using this technique, you, we were able to deliver siRNA in a uh, significantly uh, uh, more effective way. And what we show here is two deliveries uh, complement uh, five uh, uh, RNA produced, uh, protein produced in the liver, PCSK9. And what was striking, and this is the only discovery we made during development of this company we didn't anticipate, is that you can give one injection 
and see silencing over six months. So this level of prolonged release is a product of a depot in the cell. There's very small amounts of material in that tissue, and it continues to replenish the argonaut over a long period of time. Now, this is a particularly attractive mode of delivery because once every six months, it's not inconsistent with you know, having it administered in a physician's office on a routine basis, and you get very high compliance in that setting. So here is uh, delivery uh, through two different modalities, one through a, a small molecule and one through a lipid nanoparticle. Now, off-target effects are the very important when you're developing a therapeutic modality. And these SI, uh, SI RNAs, when they enter the cell, if they're fully complementary to the message, you get cleavage of the message and turnover. But if they're partially complementary to another message in the cell that you did not design them to, they will pair through a seed sequence that David Bartel coined, and that will give you microRNA type suppression of the RNA. So that off-target effect complicates the on-target effect. And could we do something about that off-target effect? And they designed into the uh, siRNA a, um, a glyconucleic acid type link, uh, as illustrated here in uh, this position. And that destabilizes the seed type pairing, but does not impact significantly on total complementarity. And that allowed us to go from a uh, uh, RNA profile such as this in the liver after delivery of siRNA to an animal. And what you see, this is twofold changes. Uh, and this is uh, non-significant, but you see with a standard siRNA, uh, these off-target microRNA type effects of less than twofold in total effect, but significant and can contribute to off-target uh, activity that's detectable. On-target is down here. But if you use that specificity variant at the particular position and do an RNA screen, this is what you see. And the on-target activity is down here. And the IC50 is about the same. In fact, a little better. So here you're getting on-target activity and suppressing microRNA target activity, and you're getting very significant silencing of a gene in the liver. Now, as we've heard, innate immune response is an important aspect of cellular uh, systems, and you want to administer these RNAs and avoid innate immune responses because they can complicate an off-target activity. And what is shown here is a number of cytokines in which with unmodified Galnac RNA and then chemically modified uh, uh, nucleotides, modified both for stability and to suppress uh, innate recognition, you see almost no uh, off-target innate uh, activity in these systems. So that further suppresses the issue of whether you have uh, on or off target activity. So over the years since uh, 2005, where we started with, uh, nylon started with partially modified material, and we began to move with different uh, technologies. And uh, as I've explained, we've reduced the dosage that's required by about three orders of magnitude, and uh, we have five approved uh, therapeutic products. Uh, the first one here is a uh, on Patro, as been mentioned before, which is a TTR. Purphuria and uh, hypergloxeremia is an S, uh, a Galnac delivery. The cholesterol is a Galnac delivery. And this TTR is a Galnac derivative. And are all approved products. 
now and being treated. Some patients on this technology have been treated for over or nearly 10 years. So we have prolonged treatment with these siRNAs with uh, certainly beneficial effects and uh, significantly insignificant, or I shouldn't say insignificant, but not complicating off-target effects. So one of the most exciting frontiers, and primarily because it's so difficult to develop drugs that are specific for processes in the brain because of the blood-brain barrier, and the variation, the enormous variation in gene expression in the brain, particularly by alternative splicing, it uh, is very exciting to think about the idea that you could deliver siRNAs to the brain and ultimately get specificity to a specific isoform splice exon in cells in the brain. And uh, that is now uh, an area of uh, great interest uh, as a new delivery modality. And uh, the current status in the conjugation to a lipid is that uh, by delivering in a uh, rat system or a primate in the cervical region by interthecal injection, you can get uh, silencing. This is SDO1 in the, the CNS uh, of about 80%. Thoracic, about the same. Cervical, about the same. And then you can move up into higher order prefrontal cortex. You see silencing. This is one injection. And then in the cerebellum. So the clinical trials have been initiated as announced by Anonym for uh, Alzheimer's APP. They're in patients and they all have data. Uh, that data will be discussed this summer. But the possibility of being able to use SI modalities in the brain for very critical regions is a, a frontier that's, uh, to me, incredibly exciting. Now, I want to talk about RNA as a regulatory factor for a few moments. Uh, RNA uh, is involved in almost every condensate type process pictured in this diagram in the cell. Uh, these condensates uh, were first recognized by Tony Hyman and not recognized. <laughs> the process of phase transition that was involved in those processes was a product of uh, Tony Hyman and Cliff Brandewine looking at a germ cell granule in, uh, in C. elegans. But if you look in the nucleus in the nucleolus, which is a, a liquid type uh, membraneless uh, condensate. Uh, that is a compl complex of RNA and protein. If you look at Cajal bodies, that's got RNA and protein as well. And most of these bodies that we see uh, in the cell are both RNA and cytoprotein. Uh, Same in splicing, I mean, stress granules, signaling punctate, even in synaptic regions, RNA is present and regulation of translation is common. So condensate type processes depend on low affinity multivalent interactions, but they also occur in most cell uh, subcellular organelles in the, in the context of RNA. So um, let's just talk about that in the context of transcription. Uh, we know that uh, if you look at uh, a region around enhancers, as a gene becomes active, an enhancer becomes active in transcription. So enhancer RNAs are, are uh, very correlated with activation of a proximal gene. If you look at the gene, you see RNA being uh, generated upstream in any sense, as well as in the precursor uh, along the gene. And we know about long non-coding RNAs uh, and 
others from other promoters, uh, divergent tri type transcription, and ribosomal RNA. So the cell has uh, got an enormous amount of RNA. Uh, some of these RNAs, these types of RNAs, enhancer RNAs, and many long non-coding RNAs remain chromatin proximal and influence gene expression in ways that we don't have good models for. Uh, if you look at the numbers per cell, they are striking. Uh, the, the level of uh, RNA per cell and the half-lives vary from some that are hours, minutes, to uh, some that are days. So when we were thinking about transcriptional processes, we have published a number of papers that argue that transcription factors with their uh, activation domains interact with uh, transcription cofactors and mediator type activities uh, to form a condensate that uh, concentrates these proteins in the vicinity of uh, the transcription factor bound to DNA. Those condensates will recruit other transcription factors, so you typically go have a cluster of transcription factors around the site that is activated subsequently for transcription. You picture that then generating polymerase, initiating producing divergent transcriptions that interact with these uh, co-activators to produce a, a condensate that is a, contains both RNA and uh, these uh, intrinsic disorder domains, and that then being a product that gives you the divergent transcription, and that when pairing to the polymerase, when the promoter giving you activation of transcription. Now, that scenario leads to a very interesting proposal for how a non-equilibrium dynamic process controls transcription because we know transcription occurs in bursts. So you get a burst of transcription and then it, the promoter will be silent and then you'll get another burst of transcription at some subsequent time. So you can picture this as the gene being uh, activated by transcription from the promoter, I mean the enhancer and the promoter, producing a condensate that pairs with the uh, gene region and that activating transcription in a burst of transcription. And because many of these factors, the mediator and others, have a net positive charge, they will, uh, by electrostatics if not others, give you a mixed condensate of RNA and protein. And in the burst of transcription, and this is a a feedback mechanism, the newly synthesized nascent RNA could then uh, titrate in excess the negative charge dissociating the condensate and giving you then a silencing of the burst of transcription. And this type of, tri uh, of titration you can do quite easily in a test tube and see that that excess RNA will uh, uh, dissociate uh, the net positive condensates related to mediator and others. So here RNA is viewed as a uh, negative charge and certainly will form these types of condensates. I want to remind you that in these condensates, micromolar to high micromolar, submillimolar type concentrations are not unusual. So any RNA in these will have a net, uh, will uh, associate likely with uh, basic charge proteins. So this is interesting in the sense that it provides possible models for a bursting of transcription, but it also points out that long non-coding RNAs in or near the enhancer promoter, uh, the gene, could both facilitate the formation of a condensate as well as facilitate the dissociation of a condensate in uh, different ways. So it's possible that some of the activity of non-coding RNAs that are proximal to chromatin is related to these issues of how RNA and protein is facilitating 
are organizing the uh, condensate at initiation. Now, I don't want to suggest that all those RNA protein complexes are nonspecific. Uh, it was recently recognized by Rick's lab, and perhaps others, but Rick's is the one I know about, is that very proximal to the DNA binding domain of a large fraction of transcription factors, there is a cluster of positive charges that are not that dissimilar from the positive charges that one sees in TAT. And I worked on TAT a number of years ago and was fascinated by the fact that this basic protein could form a adequately specific complex with the RNA with what was micromolar type specificity and dependent upon an arginine, a positive charge in the middle of an arginine cluster. So uh, this is just a, a schematic of that. Uh, here is TAT. It activates elongation, release of elongation through PCSK9, associating with this RNA. This is the number of the RNA structures. And what is important in this is that net positive arginine in a cluster of positive charge. The uh, Rev protein in HIV uses similar recognition for transport of RNA out of the nucleus. So do transcription factors interact with RNA? Uh, this is uh, an experiment uh, uh, that has been published. We're pulsing with 4-thio, doing UV cross-linking, selecting RNA that's cross-linked over a period of time and looking at what is enriched as uh, protein factors. You find uh, about 40% of all transcription factors cross-link efficiently to RNA in these types of settings. Uh, the affinities of those positive regions are approximately in the same range as affinities for DNA binding, but probably a little less in, in that. But what that suggests is that there is a network of possible interactions between transcription factors and RNA proximal to the DNA in these condensates that facilitate, and there are probably others beyond these transcription factors, that can facilitate the uh, uh, association of RNA to the chromatin region. So uh, what I've tried to summarize is uh, basically moving siRNA from a uh, laboratory observation in 2002 to a therapeutic modality that's now been put in tens of thousands of patients and will be in hundreds of thousands of patients in a few years. And as well, I think there's a whole emerging, and you heard Tom talk about this earlier, uh, opportunity where RNA is going to interact through structures in RNA with protein, and that could be modulated in ways by even small molecules uh, that could mediate changes in gene expression. And we have one example, and that's an SMA, where an oral soluble protein perturbs the splicing of exon 7 that benefits those patients. Thank you. So, Phil, the, the targeting of the CNS and uh, potentially Alzheimer's is, is you know, so uh, in intriguing. And, but I was surprised that L-Nylum announced that they were going to target uh, A-beta rather than the amyloid precursor protein uh, message rather than tau. Uh, it, can you, are you allowed to say something about that choice? Both are being studied. <laughs> I said both are being studied. Oh, both are being studied. There's, there's other business reasons why that was the, the first one. 
Yeah. In the in the very last slide, when you were talking about the transcription factors bound to the fourth IOU labeled RNA, yep. is that one sequence of RNA? Did you try different sequences oh, no, and get the same? It's it's, it's anything. Yep. Anything. A four plus linked to RNA. And you get shifted the by the RNA link and then mass spec. You get the same proteins no matter what RNA. Yeah. Yep. Thank you. Well, we take what the cell has. <laughs> That's in vivo. You're, uh, so you're labeling cells with fourth IOU. Pulse label, yep. UV array, select uh, proteins yep. bound to RNA, do mass spec. Thank you. Sorry, I wasn't, I was rushing because of you know, the, the police up here. <laughs> Other questions? <coughs> Phil, nice yep. talk. So my question is, I just wondering if this small arm is involved in the recruitment of the transcription factors because the activation of, especially at enhanced stage, you need a group of transcription factors work together to actually activate the transcription of a special unit, regulated by, mostly gene regulated by the enhanced stage. So I just wondering if this kind of small arm is actually bring all these transcription factors together actually help, most important is the recruitment of P300 to actually acetylate the, the nucleus amount in hand cell aging. Uh, all those questions are important questions. We're going to have to work it out. <laughs> we, uh, this is a, to say the least, there's an enormous amount of data that has emerged that there's a lot of RNA proximal to chromatin. The, the transcription of enhancers is very clear. The transcription of upstream, divergent transcription at the promoters are very clear, and they both correlate with activation of transcription. And the formation of one of these condensates with about 80 polymerases in that condensate pairing to the promoter region. That's what we know. So how mechanistically all that occurs What's the nature of the mediator complex? What's the nature of what's bounded, you know, to at the Tata and other promoter regions? That biochemistry is going to be difficult, but it's likely to have to be done in one of these condensates. But it's an important issue. Rachel, so you talked about a reservoir of the of the siRNA, and you said that yes. you thought it was not loaded into Argonaut. Did I understand that correctly? Yes. Uh, I wouldn't jump off a building on that conclusion. Okay. <laughs> okay. But my interpretation of the data to date is that there is a reservoir, it, and it's not in Argonaut, but it is released so it can be assembled into Argonaut. And in the CNS, I wouldn't be surprised if the half-life of that process can be over a year. And what's interesting is we don't see any off-target effects of this. That's, that's to me, it's pretty low level, <laughs> but it, it, there's, a, there's something in there we don't understand. I can guarantee you that. Actually, I think there's a lot you don't understand. <laughs> <laughs> that what gets you up in the morning. <laughs> okay, we'll move on. Thank you very much. So the next, the next speaker is Howard, uh, Howard Chang from Stanford, and he could just as well have been in this, uh, the first session that, uh, today uh, for other work that he's, that's going on in his lab, but uh, instead he's going to be talking about uh, long, uh, long non-coding RNAs. All right, well, thank you so much uh, for the introduction. I want to thank the organizers and, of course, Tom and Dan again for this uh, incredible party of the RNA world. Uh, I have to say that perhaps as a younger person in this field, um, the RNA community has always been so friendly and so uh, sort of supportive of new ideas and new investigators. And it takes great science to create a, a scientific field, but really very special people, all of you in the audience, to create a scientific home. So today I want to tell you about progress towards understanding a long-standing medical mystery. The human immune system has striking sex bias. Four out of five patients with autoimmune diseases are women. 
So for a disease like lupus, highlighted here, the ratio is 9 to 1, female to male. For Sjogren's syndrome, uh, the ratio is 19 to 1, female to male. Some of you may know that I'm a dermatologist by training, and these are some of the patients that I see and treat. And so it always sort of um, fascinated me that this would be happening. This heightened immune reactivity is really a double-edged sword. We know that, for example, in our, the current pandemic, that women do much better than men. So sex is probably the second most important characteristic after age for COVID outcomes. Also, in the case of cancer, female melanoma patients have better outcomes to cancer immunotherapy than men. Again, lots of different dif um, uh, important differences. So we think about this sex-biased immunity, and you wonder why. These are some of the common explanations. You might first think that is the sex hormones, that they are different. But in fact, it turns out that they're individuals, rare individuals with an XXY genotype, so-called Klinefelter syndrome. Because of the Y chromosome, they're phenotypically male, yet they have a female-level risk of autoimmunity. So that implies that it's not the sex hormones, but somehow is this second X chromosome or the machinery associated with that second X chromosome that actually matters. So this now brings us to the start of the show. And let me remind you that, of course, men have an X and a Y chromosome, and women have two X chromosomes. So there's a biological need to make gene expression output equivalent between this big X and this tiny Y. So apologies to the guys in the audience. The system in mammals is that one of the two X chromosomes is transcriptionally silenced. And this is done by a long non-coding RNA called EXIST. So EXIST is a 17 kb long, long non-coding RNA, okay, and it's transcribed only from the inactive X chromosome, one of the two X chromosomes in a random fashion. Uh, just 200 molecules can actually coat, spread, and silence uh, this entire chromosome. Uh, and so this is an example of a female cell uh, this is a uh, inside hybridization for exist RNA. It's highlighting this unique cytological structure called the bar body, where exist RNA is coding the X chromosome from, from which it is transcribed. So this is one of the special powers of long non coding RNA. It can mark the origin, the chromosome from which it's made to achieve allele specific regulation. And there's a small number of genes that escape this mechanism, which further define uh, sex differences. Now, this beautiful calico cat is a girl, and it reminds me to tell you that this X inactivation process, once it starts, has an incredible epigenetic memory. So the cell will remember the choice of the X, that's silence, and pass on to every daughter cell for the life of the organism. So these patches of color are basically uh, sort of pigment genes that are on the X chromosome that have been silenced, and all the daughter cells, then when they migrate, Right, basically show you patches uh, where the pigment cells are going. So this is the original lineage tracing mechanism. So on the molecular level, really the key hallmark of axon activation is the loss of chromatin access. Let me remind you that in every human cell, two meters of DNA is packed into a 10 micron nucleus. So all of your, most of your DNA is highly compacted, except for the active regulatory elements that the cell is using. And those will be the enhancers, promoters, and so forth. So a few years ago, my colleague Will Greenleaf and I introduced this method, a tag seek, using transposons to tag active regulatory elements to map uh, where they're active. So if you look across, for example, the X chromosome, and the, uh, the whole chromosome is shown here on, on the uh, X axis, the active X has lots of accessible elements, whereas the inactive X has greatly lost that accessibility, except for the genes that escape X inactivation, such as exit itself. So in the top picture, we're seeing actually a visual version of attack called attack C. And you can see that really every place this exists RNA is at, there's a black hole of accessibility, right? And so what's going on is that exists is actually pulling this whole chromosome into this kind of uh, death star, and really a hole of heterochromatin, and basically creating this silent domain. And so it was long thought that EXIST would work with protein partners. And so uh, several years ago, we, used a, we developed an RNA-directed proteomic method to identify that this EXIST long RNA, 70 kb, actually associates 81 uh, protein partners. Mitch Gutman's lab independently did similar experiments. 
And putting our two data sets together, it revealed that 10 of these were direct RNA protein interactions, and the other ones were indirect protein protein interactions. So, this was a big job to figure out how uh, basically um, uh, 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 which partners were most important. And here we're helped really by some prior genetics done by Anton Woods. So, he had discovered that, of course, exists RNA has multiple sequence repeats. And this very small region called the A repeat actually was absolutely critical for gene silencing. So, our A repeat deletion mutant could still be transcribed, still spread and coat the whole chromosome but could not shut down gene expression. So we repeated this proteomic experiment in the wild-type cell and also the A-repeat deletion mutant. So this is a uh, scatter plot of the peptide counts in these two experiments. Okay, so full length on the x-axis and A-repeat on the y-axis. So you see that everything is on the 45-degree diagonal except for three proteins whose peptide counts fall to zero. So that says that these three proteins require the AREP for, inter for interaction, and also that this uh, long non-coding RNA is really a modular scaffold. Different parts of the RNA bind different proteins. We were then able to focus on these three proteins and discover that this protein called SPEN was absolutely critical uh, for gene silencing by exit. So this is silencing an excellent gene, and if you knock out SPEN, uh, the ability to silence goes down. I basically is completely abrogated. So SPEN was actually a, 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 a known gene that was involved in development, but had never been implicated in X inactivation before. And so it turns out this is an ancient protein that uh, exists in plants and in, in fruit flies, like organisms that don't do X inactivation. And their role is to silence transposons. Okay, so please remember that. And the structure of SPEN is really uh, perfectly suited for this job. So on the end terminus, uh, basically four professional uh, RM, RNA binding domains. On the C terminus, a, a, a protein interaction domain that recruits a number of chromatin repressor complex proteins. And we later showed that this RM domain directly interacts with the A repeat, actually, experiments we did with help of the Czech lab. Okay. So, Ava Carter was a graduate student in the lab, and she was studying uh, SPEN. And when we knocked out SPEN, sure enough, X inactivation was completely uh, absent. But we also found that across the autosomes, that a number of loci gain chromatin access. So that implied that spends needed to shut them down. And nearly half of these elements were actually endogenous retroviruses called ERV-K elements. So we learned that, in fact, SPEN was a surveillance mechanism to shut down transposons. If these transposons become leaky, they would start to make an RNA, and the RNA would tell the cell that there's a problem, and that would recruit SPEN to restore heterochromatin integrity. This was a major clue as to how perhaps this whole system evolved. Because the A repeat I was telling you about actually has a striking sequence similarity to one of these RNAs derived from these endogenous retroviruses. And this is the secondary structure model. So together, this set of data suggested that X inactivation arose by a process of viral mimicry. And that is that when a um, ancient X-linked protein coding gene were in, was invaded by a retrotransposon and had this little piece of RNA, this transcript gained the ability to recruit SPEN. And when this process got amplified, right, and this process then this evolved uh, into a device that we think of, uh, exists really as a trick, right? It's a device to trick the female cell into thinking that the X chromosome is having a raging viral infection. And then you can mobilize this very powerful anti-transposon system to shut down the chromosome to achieve the purpose of dosage compensation. So please remember this perhaps as the original sin in the system and kind of what I'm going to tell you about next. Okay. So I told you about this powerful epigenetic memory that lasts over uh, life. And so X inactivation choice uh, establishment happens very early in embryonic development, actually in the blastocyst stage. It was previously thought that after that point, everything is remembered by DNA methylation. That turned out to be not true. Every cell in the woman's body maintains uh, X inactivation, and there's actually an ongoing role for exist in somatic cells, including in B cells and myeloid cells. And being Fei Yu, a very talented postdoc, discover that there are additional complexes with different partners, but always spend that form in these somatic cells that maintain X inactivation. And one of the cell types that divide a lot and really need this process turns out to be B cells. 
And so in the absence of ongoing exist activity, one of the excellent genes that can become derepressed is toll-like receptor 7, which we already heard about this morning. Of course, this is a key RNA sensor. Uh, and uh, in, in B cells, the consequence of losing axon activation or exist activity is actually derepression of toll-like receptor 7 and, a and, and basically an expansion of a kind of cells called atypical B cells. And I'll tell you more about these B cells uh, in a moment. Okay. So this explanation so far invokes a second X chromosome, again, a sort of chromosome dosage effect. But I want to tell you about a new set of experiments that further change our view and really suggest that this very special RNA exists as a key role in sex bias immunity. Okay. So I hope that you may be reassured by the knowledge that doctors in the U.S. have to take a test every 10 years to maintain their certification. Okay. Uh, it's called, yeah, so, and it's kind of like doing a qualifying exam again. So I was going through such a process, and so during the day, I was looking at the molecular biology of all the proteins that were pulling out, and at night, I was memorizing basically different autoantigens that physicians use to diagnose and classify patients. And I realized that, and so these protein names and antigen names sometimes have very arcane names. They have different names of the same protein then I realized actually a lot of the same proteins I was reading about were also in our exist-enriched proteins. That is that patients with these female bias autoimmune disease are making autoantibodies against these exist-associated proteins. Okay? And these include very classic antigens. And this led to the idea that perhaps this exist RNA protein complex would be a female-specific trigger of autoimmunity. This very large polymer, or this giant RNA, Lots of repeats, now coding a whole chromosome, another giant polymer, is present in every female cell. So if a cell were to die, they will leak out this giant polymer, presenting these RNA binding proteins in the scaffold that could potentially cross-link immune cells and activate the immune system. Now, some of you may know that actually there are patients with uh, antibodies against the centromere, so-called Crest syndrome, and there are other patients with autoantibodies against spliceosome subunits, right? Again, same explanation. And back in the day, enterprising molecular biologists took these patient autoserum to purify and identify components of these molecular machines. Okay? And so this is the same potential concept, except this is an even bigger polymer, not just a cent centromere, but a whole chromosome. Okay? And so we thought about a lot of ways to test this, and the most convincing experiment we could come up with was to make a male mouse that would express exist. And we thought if we could confer female-level autoimmunity, with this transgene in a male animal, that would mean that you do not need female sex hormones. You don't even need a second X chromosome. Just this exists RNA protein complex could potentially confer a disease. So this is easier said than done, because if you express exists from any chromosome, it will shut down its expression, and that will be a cell lethal event, right? But I already told you about this a repeat deletion mutant that would scaffold 78 out of the 81 proteins and was spread across the whole chromosome. So working together with the lab at Anton Woods, we developed this exist a repeat transgene under this TET uh, operator system, so it's doxycycline inducible, knocked it into chromosome 11, okay, and then in the presence of doxycycline, we can induce exist to the level seen in female animals, but now in males across multiple tissues, and uh, as shown by the inside the hypothesis at the bottom, created a fake bar body, now coding not the X chromosome, but chromosome 11. Okay. So now we need the right kind of autoimmune model. And it turns out that many mouse models of autoimmunity don't have any sex bias. But one such model that does show that is called the pristane-induced model of lupus. And so pristane is a compound that induces actually both tissue damage and inflammation. And uh, yeah, as you can see, this Kaplan-Meier survival curve, uh, female animals are much more susceptible than males. And this requires actually a specific genetic background. Uh, and so um, Diana Du, a very brave postdoc, took up this challenge. And actually, through the, actually, the entire depths of the pandemic, she was the only person in the mouse room. She would not give up. And so actually, all the power to her, to all the experiments I'm going to show you. Okay. So we're going to be, in, in this following set of experiments, there are several different genotypes and conditions. So they're all color-coded. They're always going to be in the same order. So we have the positive control. These are the female mice that are going to get the disease. We have a negative control, the male mice that hopefully will not get the disease. We'll have our test case, the male exists transgenic, getting treated. Okay, okay. 
And we have, of course, then uh, leaving out one of the two conditions, so these are the additional controls. So what Diana found was that, indeed, uh, in the right genetic background, that uh, the male uh, exists transgene treated with pristin can induce autoantibodies. For example, females get autoantibodies and males do not, but males transgenic now get autoantibodies, uh, and they, have, they get it with much higher, uh, tighter, and, and with complement activation. Moreover, this is enough to confer actually multi-organ disease and so now looking at histology of the kidney or liver, you can see these basically vacuolation interface cells, and there is a complete pathology score summing across all the tissues. And again, uh, females get the disease, males do not, and the males transgenic uh, basically start to approach uh, basically female level disease. The effect is a little bit not 100% penetrant, not every animal gets it, uh, but we, uh, we only see this uh, level in males with the exist transgenic, so, and this is highly significant. Okay, so this really says that this exist transgene is sufficient to confer uh, this kind of autoimmunity uh, in this mouse model. At the molecular level, we can also see then, because we have autoantibodies, we imply T cells and B cells must be working together. So looking at the chromatin pattern in T cells, CD4 T cells, we can actually define a pattern that distinguish male animals versus female individuals. And we can see then that you know, our transgenics, a subset of the, uh, the exist transgenics, flip their pattern to become more female-like. And this actually maps to the cell type composition that there are more naive T cells, CD4 T cells, uh, in the male animals, which are now uh, they're, like, they're gone. They turn into effector memory cells uh, in uh, both female animals and also the exist transgenics. We took this to then, uh, and this is correlated with changes uh, in gene expression, for example, uh, TR9. So we study this now at increasingly higher resolution using single cell analysis, looking at the blood and the spleen and, and bone marrow. And so we focus on sets of cells that are increasingly represented both in females and also transgenic, uh, exist transgenic males. And one such signature we identified was a class of B cells, again, called atypical B cells. Okay? And this is quantified here using this violin plot that uh, these kind of uh, ZEP2 positive atypical B cells are expanded. And so I should explain that these class of cells get their name because B cells are activated by two signals, uh, antibody cross-linking and a second signal called CD40 uh, ligation. But these cells can actually be activated by toll-like receptor instead, bypassing uh, the CD40 signal. But interestingly, these animals are actually known to accumulate in aged females. Uh, and so this actually fits, again, this female bias uh, sort of story. So finally, we want to bring this back to patients. I, I told you about all these mouse experiments, and we thought that, wow, if we have all these autoantibodies uh, already to some of the exist um, protein uh, complex subunits, maybe the other protein subunits would also be novel antigen. That had been missed by our rheumatologist colleagues. So we built a protein array. So we got our hands on about 100 plus, uh, actually, of, of, of these protein fragments that, uh, that represent um, the exist RMP complex, build an array, and then study a serous sample from patients with a, a number of a female biased autoimmune diseases, including dermatomyositis, lupus, and scleroderma. So on the volcano plot on the right, uh, the red dots indicate significant autoreactivity against these novel components in the exist RMP complex. And these subunits actually can distinguish, uh, these autoreactivities can distinguish uh, different types of autoimmune diseases, for example, separating uh, scleroderma from dermatomyositis uh, versus lupus. And even the ones that are in common, uh, there actually are different, uh, interesting differences in titer and also in, in, among uh, the two sexes. Some male patients can get these autoantibodies, right? So it says that you don't have to have this RNA, uh, but there are other ways of potentially getting there. Okay. So what I told you then is that uh, the exist RNA could really be a dominant RNA protein complex in autoimmunity. There's a price to be paid for this very powerful epigenetic machinery. And that um, in the case of invoking uh, this kind of a um, sort of powerful sort of chromatin silencing, uh, this sets up a situation that perhaps the RNA was scaffold, um, RNA binding proteins and chromatin proteins in a format that could be more recognized by the immune system. And we imagine that this sets up a series of changes that start with T cell chromatin change and autoantibodies that would later develop into organ damage. 
In the interest of time, I didn't talk to you about our work with the same model, but in a genetically resistant background. In that case, you'll get some of these chromatin changes, you'll get some of these autoantibodies at lower titers, but never an organ disease. So that implies that these two events happen first, and this happens later. And moreover, we know from studies, of, for example, from army recruits, uh, that people can develop autoantibodies years before they actually develop autoimmune disease, right? This is consistent with human observation. And so, uh, so we think that this RNA is one such driver for female bias autoimmunity, and that perhaps uh, there are other RNAs, right? So these proteins are not unique to only associate with existing. So other RNAs could potentially do this, but of course, they don't have this kind of uh, large target size as, as the exist RNA. Okay, so we hope that this set of findings will provide an opportunity to improve uh, patient diagnosis uh, and therapy. Okay, and I want to end by acknowledging the people who did this work. And so uh, Bingfei Yu uh, did the work uh, describing uh, exist uh, function in B cells and TR7 escape, and Diana Ju is a very brave postdoc uh, who took on this exist uh, transgenic mouse project. Uh, we thank all the patients and uh, collaborators for, for their help, especially my colleagues uh, PJ Utz, our clinical, uh, clinical collaborators, and also Anton Woods, uh, and I've got Tom Chuck actually early on in our work with Exist and SPEN. I gratefully acknowledge my funding sources, and thank you very much for your attention. Excellent talk. Thank you so much. Can you comment on the implications of this work for, for instance, CAR-T uh, cancer immunotherapy and sex-based differences and the development of an allogeneic therapy? Wow, that's a deep question. Okay, so, um, so uh, yeah, so you're asking about, um, let me come back to this model. So um, maybe, you, um, okay, so I think that my understanding of CAR-T cells is that we're going after either, of course, uh, cancer-associated antigens like CD19, right, which are um, ubiquitous or in both males and females. But you're talking about alloreactivity. Are you thinking about them like allogeneic uh, CAR T cells? Okay. Yeah. So I think that one perhaps immediate uh, sort of um, information is that there are some differences, as, as I pointed out, in kind of the cells you start with for making CAR T cells. In that. The male and female immune systems are not exactly the same, right? So if you start with just uh, T cells, uh, maybe there's some difference in kind of the outcome of the quality of cells you would make. I think the second aspect is that uh, there are some, um, if you think, think about these specific um, sort of uh, autoreactive cells, there might be a greater chance of such an event in females. But I, I should point out that, of course, most women, the vast majority of women, do not get autoimmune disease, right? So you still need the right genetic background and the right kind of tissue damage Right, some sort of unfortunate tissue damage at the right time to set up this kind of immunological outcome. So, uh, uh, the model is uh, very interesting, but there's a lot of RNA and protein complexes released into the blood system. I mean, the cells die and all, all this massive amount of RNA in them. So, is there a component in the excess RNA that says to the system, there's anything attached to this, we want an immune response to. Is, what makes it unique that it is an excess RNA complex that gives autoantibodies? Right, this is a great question. So I don't think I have a full answer to that, but one of the three slides that I took out was an analysis looking at how, uh, when cells die, how their chromatin gets chopped up. And it turns out that the inactive X chromosome, being less accessible, accumulates as larger fragments, okay? So just basically molecular, so you know the nucleosomal ladder you normally get, and the inactive X is just like a bigger piece. And so if we believe in this theory that these larger polymers, right, are better able to cross-link immune cells, then exist RNA is obviously associated with the inactive X. And so it just basically, it's just a size argument, not a specific molecular feature. Uh, so I have a question about like viruses in the relation to this. So there is a correlation between viral infection and the onset of some of these autoimmune diseases. And so I'm curious how your model fits in with that with something like the Epstein-Barr virus or things that are more likely to set off that response. Yeah, very interesting. Yeah, so I think that the, um, the, this model still basically, I think in, in part depends on basically either some sort of like uh, uh, organ damage or some sort of immune trigger, right? Some sort that would lead to some sort of cross-reactivity. 
And I think that the, um, so I think that's still a necessary component. But one of the results I highlighted was that, at least in the mouse model, that there were a smaller number of, of cells are in the naive state of CD4 cells, and more of the cells in the theme animals have already been mobilized into these effector memory. Okay? And so basically that implies that, if, you know, with of course like priming and boosting for vaccines, that the second time they see something, if there's some cross-reactivity, those cells would expand more easily right, and, 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 and get uh, revved up. So that could be a potentially a difference why if you, even if you got the same infection, if there's a, already a pre-underlying level of activation, you could have a different outcome. Hey, how a nice talk. So I just wonder a uh, basic questions that you all you are focused on now are B cells that actually produce antibody autoantibodies against yourself. But uh, I just wonder, you know, B cells are all driven by T cells. So do you ever look into the what kind of uh, T cell antigens that actually from this unabiding protein that actually triggers uh, uh, you know, autoimmune response? Uh, yes, great question. Uh, so yeah, once, of course, once you start getting autoantibodies, you'd expect T cell help. We did a lot of the single cell, actually, RNA-seq, chromatin, multiome, um, and we just saw a stronger B cell signal, so which I highlighted for the, the atypical B cells. I think there could be still a difference in the T cells. We don't have sufficient power yet. I'm very interested in, for example, T follicular helper cell, uh, cells, which would, would potentially make sense, um, but we don't have an exact pinpoint yet on which T cells would be different that would be evoked by exist. Riju. Hey, Howard, great talk. Um, many years ago, like in the, I think, early 80s, late 70s, uh, Joan Stites showed that in systemic lupus, some versions of systemic lupus, um, the antibodies that she found were, were against SNRNPs. And in fact, I think she used those antibodies to pull out additional RNAs. Yep. That's another disease, I think, that has a strong female-to-male bias. How do you think about that if the antigens there are SNR, SNRNPs? Yeah, so I think that some of those components, right, some of those proteins are actually in common, uh, actually sometimes uh, uh, you know, on, um, on these other RNPs as well. So I think, uh, um, I, so I think these are not mutually excluded. I think there are many RNAs that can get you there. Uh, this idea is just that this particular RNA is ubiquitous, is in every female cell, right? It has a, creates a very large sort of antigen landscape because of the size of the polymer it makes. And I would also say that this is a missed opportunity, that if any of you have, know that there's a test that doctors order for called ANA, anti-nuclear antibody, but that test is done on a standardized cell line that lacks the inactive X chromosome. So we do actually tens of thousands of these tests every year, but you'll never see a pattern that would suggest exists is involved because of the, cell, the, the choice of cells that the field has made without any really insight, okay? So all of our patients are female, but we don't do the test on the right substrate. So, so right, so something like that would just get annotated as, oh, speckle or you, know, you want RMP, you would never annotate it as anti-exist. Tracy. Hey, hey, Tracy. So in addition to the, um, the specific Spec, the sex-specific uh, manifestations of the autoimmune diseases, there are also um, different populations where you see the, these particular diseases like lupus and That's right. pernicious anemia. So I'm wondering, can you say anything about how that might be related to what you're seeing with X inactivation? Yeah, I think that's a really interesting um, direction. I mean, I think I, we, we have not done enough to really say anything co concrete, but for, for example, uh, for scleroderma, uh, it's actually, in, in African Americans, it's often a more severe disease. There's some different uh, autoantibody phenotypes. So I feel like hopefully this opens a door to then really study a lot of these other processes in much greater depth. Yeah, I think we should move on. Okay, thank you very much. Now for something totally different. Uh, <laughs> Eric is going to talk about um, muscle diseases and how uh, CRISPR is used there. Okay, last but not least. Really happy to be here. I love coming to Boulder, so thank you so much. I feel like I've landed in an exclusive RNA club here, so I need to learn the secret handshake. So I'm going to uh, switch gears a bit and tell you, uh, update you on some of our recent work uh, on uh, trying to apply CRISPR gene editing to correct diseases of muscle and the heart. 
So this work began uh, several years ago when we sought to develop permanent cures for Duchenne muscular dystrophy, one of the most devastating diseases on the planet. We began by setting up a muscular dystrophy clinic in Dallas where patients come in and we take a small blood sample and we can convert that blood sample into beating cardiomyocytes. So these are cardiomyocytes that we generated from a sample from a boy with Duchenne. And then we can also engineer these into three dimensions. And using these, uh, these patient-derived cells, we then optimize gene editing strategies. We optimize guide RNAs for those that can most efficiently restore the expression of the missing protein, in this case, dystrophin. We've then developed mouse models that harbor the most commonly uh, seen uh, mutations in boys with Duchenne and have cured those mice uh, by CRISPR. And then we went on and uh, cured dogs with CRISPR uh, that also had Duchenne. And that work was uh, carried on by a biotech company called Exonix Therapeutics and has now been extended into uh, IND enabling studies uh, at Vertex Therapeutics. So building on the lessons we learned uh, along uh, this particular path, I want to uh, talk to you today about our efforts to extend those studies into correction of genetic disorders that lead to cardiomyopathies. So I think you all um, are aware heart disease remains the number one cause of mortality, or at least it did before COVID, and hopefully that will change. And uh, genetic mutations uh, seen in roughly one out of 250 people cause cardiomyopathy. And cardiomyopathies can take various forms. They can lead to dilation of the heart and loss of uh, contractility. They can lead to hypertrophy. But of course, the most common form of heart disease is ischemic cardiomyopathy. So since this is obviously an RNA meeting, I wanted to talk to you about uh, one of the most severe forms of dilated cardiomyopathy that's caused by mutations in a muscle-specific RNA binding protein known as RBM20. And this protein is required for splicing of many important muscle genes, including Titan, the largest gene uh, in the genome. RBM20 resides uh, in the nucleus where it mediates splicing, but mutations in patients that have cardiomyopathy prevent the nuclear import of RBM20, and this leads to disruption of the contractile apparatus and a death of cardiac muscle cells. So here's the structure of RBM20. This protein um, has a central RS-rich domain that mediates its nuclear localization and its RNA binding. And importantly, mutations in the RS domain account for 2 to 6% of dilated cardiomyopathy uh, in the human population. And if you look at the RS domain, you can see it's littered with point mutations that uh, lead to uh, DCM. So we wondered whether we could correct any of these types of mutations, and I'm going to tell you, show you today an example of how we went about doing that. So again, we went back to uh, patients, and we isolated uh, patient-derived uh, cardiomyocytes, harboring a common and lethal a mutation in RBM20 called R634Q. And this R634Q mutation arises by the conversion of a, a guanine to an adenine, which changes the codon, as you can see here. We reasoned that this single nucleotide might lend itself to adenine-based editing. And I think you're all familiar with uh, base editing, which was pioneered by David Liu. So we screened a variety of potential guide RNAs along with various base editors and ultimately settled on uh, this guide RNA, which we call uh, uh, single guide RNA1. Here's the PAM sequence, and here's the target uh, adenine at the center, and we tested whether we could convert that back to the wild-type guanine. And there's the efficiency of editing in patient-derived cells, so roughly 90% of the target adenine was converted back to the wild-type guanine. Here's a bystander adenine. It has no bystander editing. So we reconstituted the system uh, in vitro. These are cardiomyos human cardiomyocytes made from iPS cells. And here you can see the RBM20 in uh, puncti uh, in the nucleus where it mediates splicing. Here are the patient-derived cells. And now you can see that RBM20 is uh, localized in the cytoplasm where it forms molecular condensates. And so you can also see that the sarcomeres, the contractile apparatus, is disrupted uh, in these 
uh, patient-derived cardiomyocytes. So we introduced the base editing system uh, into these cells. And here you can see that RBM20, by this single uh, nucleotide base edit, is uh, restored to its rightful location in the nucleus where it mediates splicing. And you can see the sarcomeres are now reorganized. So we wanted to then move this into an in vivo system. So we generated mice that harbored the same mutation. In this case, uh, codon 636 is the same as 634 in humans. So here's a wild type normal heart for those of you who don't look at hearts every day. And here's a heterozygous and here's the homozygous heart which is massively dilated. Fractional shortening is a measure of uh, how efficiently the heart can contract. And you can see that these hearts, uh, their fractional shortening is down around 10%. That's the lower limit of contractility that's uh, sufficient for life. So we wanted to ask whether we could edit this mutation in vivo. So because the base editors are large, we had to go to a, a split system. So in this case, we take a heart-specific heart promoter, the proponent T promoter, fused to uh, the base editor and a Cas9 nickase, and then we use protein intines to mediate splicing to a, a separate uh, protein cassette, and that has the other end of SP Cas9, and then we uh, use a uh, U6 promoter to drive the expression of the guide RNA for the base editor. And so when you put this into cells in vivo, and the AAV9 uh, vector that we used has tropism for the heart, then it will reconstitute the A-base editing system. This is the aficionados. This is the, the ultimate uh, form that we, we settled on. So here you can see a histological section. This is the left ventricular chamber, the right ventricular chamber, and these are the atria. Here's the homozygous mouse. You can see his heart is extremely dilated, and you can completely rescue the uh, histopathology in these animals by a single dose of this A-base editor. And here you can see it not only rescues the histopathology, it rescues life. So uh, here's the mutant animals are almost all dead by 100 days, and uh, the corrected animals have a normal lifespan. So here you can see this is histology through the hearts of these animals. RBM20, as you know, is normally localized in the nucleus. Here's the mutant hearts. Now it's located, localized in these pathogenic molecular condensates in the cytoplasm. And following single A-base editing, it's restored to its rightful location uh, in the nucleus. So correction not only uh, restores architecture of the heart and, and viability, it normalizes the transcriptome. These are representative heat maps of genes that are dysregulated in the mutant. When you correct these animals, uh, the transcriptome is normalized. The most sensitive marker of cardiac stress is a, a gene called NPPA. It's blasting in the mutant hearts, and when you correct them with A-base editing, it goes back to baseline. I told you that RBM20 is essential for proper splicing of Titan, the largest gene in the genome. And so here's the normal adult form of, of Titan, which has uh, skipping of exon 51 to 218. And you can see that in uh, the mutant, the adult form of Titan is not expressed. It's not correctly spliced. But when you correct them, splicing uh, is restored. So we feel confident that we can correct dilated cardiomyopathies as occurs in Duchenne muscular dystrophy and from RBM20 mutations and probably others. So we've moved on then to other uh, forms of heart disease, in particular uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So here's a little biology 101. This is a sarcomere. It's the fundamental contractile apparatus of all striated muscles. It's composed of actin and myosin filaments, as you can see here. And mutations in components of the sarcomere are the most common cause of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy in humans. Hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, as you can see here, is manifested as a thickening of the ventricular wall, which compromises cardiac contractility. This is the number one cause of death on the athletic playing field or on the basketball court. So we wanted to ask whether we could correct dilated cardiomyopathy. And so we turned to the most uh, well-studied and common mutation, that's a single amino acid mutation uh, in the beta myosin head, arginine 403 converted to glutamine. This causes hypercontractility, hypertrophy, 
and, uh, and death in humans. So we obtained uh, patient blood samples, which we converted to cardiomyocytes, and then we screened a whole series of base editors with various guide RNAs to try to identify an optimum one that could correct this mutation. So here's the, the mutation. This is the, glu the pathogenic glutamine, which is in the head region of beta-myosin. And you can see it, the mutation is a G2A uh, mutation. So again, it lent itself to A-base editing. So we screened all these A-base editors for any that could convert this, this adenine back to guanine and convert the glutamine to wild-type arginine. And here you can see two, these are um, IPS cardiomyocytes from two different patients. And with the optimum A-base editor shown here with an optimum guide that we identified, we could edit almost 100% of the target. And these are bystander A's you can see here also in the, underneath the guide RNA, and there's virtually no off-target editing, or at least it's well below 1% of, uh, of wild type. So without getting into all the nuances of uh, myosin biology, suffice it to say that the, the major myosin in humans, in human hearts, is beta myosin or myosin heavy chain 7, but the major myosin in mice is alpha myosin or MYH6. And your own Leslie Leinwand here is really the, the world authority on these, these myosins. So we wanted to test the optimized human guides that we'd already identified for in human IPS, but we couldn't test them uh, in mice because mice express the different myosins. So we humanized these mice. We knocked into the locus the human genomic sequence, and then we could use the human guides to uh, correct that, that sequence. So if you knock in the, the human sequence into the mouse and you put in the R403Q mutation, that these mice develop all the hallmarks of hypertrophy and cardiac pathology seen in, in people. Here you can see they have wall thickening, and this is fibrosis, which is a hallmark of, of uh, hypertrophy uh, in, the, in these mice. So these mice were uh, really a, an exceptional platform for us to test this strategy as to whether could we correct a genetic mutation for cardiomyopathy uh, using uh, base editing in vivo. And so th this just shows a number of representative uh, assays that we performed. Here you can see that wall thickness in uh, these mice is enhanced. That can be brought back down to wild type by A base editing. The heart weight is elevated in the mutant mice. That can be brought back down. Fibrosis marked by collagen can be corrected, and virtually every marker of cardiac disease can be uh, prevented by a single dose of an A-base editor uh, in the system. And the Seidman lab at Harvard, uh, at the same time as we did, published uh, similar uh, results. So I think this, it looks very promising to be able to deploy types of CRISPR editing to correct lethal cardiomyopathies, both dilated and, cardi and uh, hypertrophic. But the main form of heart disease that occurs, uh, that is the most common cause of human mortality, is uh, when occlusion of coronary arteries, which causes death of cardiomyocytes and fibrosis. And so we wondered, could we tackle this form of acquired heart disease by, by gene editing? And we knew that a nodal point in the pathway for cardiac pathogenesis was the activation of an enzyme called calcium calmodulin dependent protein kinase 2. So this is the idea that we are uh, beginning to explore. And that is, might one be able to use base editing to modify a target amino acid on a signaling protein to render that amino acid inactive without disrupting the physiological or homeostatic function of the enzyme, but just taking out the pathogenic uh, residue, for example, a phosphorylation site or such. So chemkinase is, is the nodal point for cardiac pathogenesis, and when it gets pathologically activated, it dysregulates a plethora of downstream uh, events in the heart that are summarized here. And we know that hypoxia, as occurs following coronary artery occlusion, generates uh, reactive oxygen species. And this 
triggers the pathogenic, the hyperactivation of this enzyme, which then leads to deterioration of, of cardiac function, leading to impaired contractility, fibrosis, uh, and death. So this is the structure of Camkinase 2 delta, the key trigger for cardiac pathogenesis. And what's been shown from a number of labs is, is that there are two methionine residues in the regulatory domain. And in response to uh, oxidative stress, those two residues become oxidized, and this unleashes the catalytic domain. It leads to a conformational change and to the phosphorylation of promiscuous targets. So we wondered, could we block the pathogenic activation of CAMK2 delta by CRISPR editing, but not inactivate the essential function of CAMK2, which is required for a normal homeostasis uh, in the heart? So these two critical methionines right here, methionines 281 and 282 in the regulatory domain, are, as, as you would know, encoded by an ATG codon. So we thought, if we could change the adenine in these ATG codons, we could convert those methionines into valines by making an A to G mutation uh, through A base editing. And so we screened a, a large number of base editors and guides, and we identified some that could specifically correct, uh, modify those two targets. And here's the efficiency of correction of those uh, of of mutagenesis of those two targets in human, cell, human cardiomyocytes. So A17 and 14 under, under the guide RNA are the targets. They're edited at about 80% efficiency in these human cells. There's one bystander edit at, at position 10. You can see that here, which converts a hist histidine to an arginine. We don't think that has a, has a functional impact. And we're looking at that, and you can see because that also gets edited. The other ones uh, do not get edited. So in uh, response to uh, ischemia, this is where you induce hypoxia and then reoxygenate. These are in human cardiomyocytes. One can get oxidation of CAMK2, as I've already told you, but using a guide RNA to base edit CAMK2 at that site, one can completely block the, the pathogenic oxidation and one can uh, block the pathogenic activation of the kinase. So we, we wanted to ask, could we adapt this technology to deliver it right into an injured heart? What I've told you in the, the previous examples of hypertrophic and dilated cardiomyopathy were examples where we had to go systemically, and that carries with it a number of uh, possible pitfalls. But in this case, we wondered, could we really, uh, with surgical precision, deliver a base editor right to the region of an infarct and edit the pathogenic signaling molecule and preserve cardiac function in the face of hypoxia. So this was the experimental design. I won't go through all the details. And here shows the specificity. So the anterior wall of the heart is the region where the infarct occurs. And you can see when we deliver the base editing components there, we can get very high base editing in vivo, and there's virtually no editing at distal sites uh, in the heart. And here's a cross-section through the, through the heart. Here's the left ventricle and the right ventricle. Here's the region where we've induced ischemia reperfusion injury by depriving this region of, of blood flow, and this leads to the formation of an infarct, stained here in red. And when you perform base editing to just prevent the oxidation of those two key residues in CAMP kinase 2, you can largely prevent uh, the formation of a fibrotic scar, and this preserves cardiac function, which I won't show you for the sake of time. So what I've told you then is that this enzyme is really a critical driver of cardiac pathogenesis through the oxidation of, of these two methionines. And I've told you that one can edit those to, well, I've told you that once those get oxidized, this leads to pathogenic activation of the enzyme, and all the downstream sequelae of cardiac disease. But if one base edits just those two residues, one can convert them to valines, and this renders the heart insensitive to um, that type of, of stimulus. So we, we think that, at least as a proof of concept study, this represents a new way of thinking of how one could 
selectively inactivate a pathogenic signaling pathway. In this case, we've done it in the heart, but you can all think about other diseases where such pathways exist. So going forward, I think there's a number of uh, issues that we and the field uh, need to confront. Uh, first and foremost, can we identify correctable mutations, and what is the spectrum of new diseases that could be uh, treated by these types of approaches? I think these approaches lend themselves to catastrophic diseases, such as muscular dystrophy, which I described, and, and heart diseases, and there are obviously many, many uh, other diseases that uh, could be treated in these, manner, in these manners. When to intervene, I think the earlier, the, uh, the, the better. What is the dose? Uh, in this case, we've used AAV, which is the best delivery vehicle we have right now. But from the talks we heard earlier, I'm extremely optimistic that there may be some LNP delivery systems on the way. And I think the heart lends itself to uh, LNP delivery because there's never been a cardiologist that didn't want to put something in the heart. So uh, you, you can really deliver things there with uh, great uh, specificity. So mode of delivery, uh, as I said, we've talked about AAV. We're also working on lipid nanoparticle delivery strategies and have some headway there. Immunosuppression, I, I've shown you efforts to, to deliver Cas9. I think ultimately one would need immunosuppression uh, over the long term if, if there's going to be persistent expression of Cas9, but there are also strategies that we and others are working on to get rid of Cas9, uh, and uh, hopefully those will be coming soon. And of course, cost is always a consideration. So lastly, I want to just acknowledge the people that did this work. The, the three stories I told you about are, are here. Uh, the RBM20 work was done by a Japanese cardiologist, Takahiko. Uh, the MYH7 mutagenesis was done by an MD-PhD student, Andreas Chai. And the CAM kinase editing was done uh, by a German cardiologist, uh, Simon Lebeck. And we've had a very close uh, collaboration with Vertex on the IND enabling studies for the Duchenne work, which I didn't talk about. Thank you. So I, I assume your base editor was some, uh, maybe the catalytic domain of ADARs, is that what it was? And so, um, there's some level of endogenous ADAR in the heart, so I'm wondering if you don't, you know, did you try something with just the guide RNA to see if it was edited without your adding the catalytic domain? We, what is it? So that is ADAR, it's just the, it, it, well, it's the tRNA catalytic domain. It's same, same question. So. Um, We've, we um, have not seen any editing with guide RNA alone, and so endogenous activities are, are inadequate. And as I mentioned, uh, we have uh, we screened a lot of A-base editors with varying uh, PAM specificities and uh, settled on the ones that work the best. With your systemic yeah. transformations to do CRISPR and alter the heart. Oh, hey. Hi. <clears throat> Um, do you have any evidence for the fraction of cardiomyocytes which are actually transformed? Yes, this is an important question. Uh, we think roughly half of the cardiomyocytes are transformed with the AAV uh, delivery strategy that we're doing right now. This obviously leads to, to, can lead to mosaicism in the heart. So far, we've not seen any adverse consequences of that, and we've carried, certainly with the Duchenne work, in mice and in dogs, uh, we carried that work out for the lifespan of uh, many of those animals, and we never saw any um, arrhythmias or adverse consequences of incomplete editing in the heart, but it's, it's something that we're looking at carefully. Um, it's here, yeah, for the uh, dilated cardiomyopathy and the hypertrophy, I, I think you were treating the mice, this newborn mice, right? Do you, um, is it too late to do it after disease onset, or, or is it reversible in these cases? Uh, it's a good question. Um, all of these sorts of disorders are going to need to be treated before that there's extreme pathology, uh, because once you've started losing cardiomyocytes, and especially once you have fibrosis, 
it's difficult or maybe not possible to, to get rid of that. Importantly, though, most of these patients are genetically diagnosed. Not all of them, but a lot, most of them. Certainly in Duchenne, they all know that they've got the, the disorder, and in many of these cardiomyopathies, they know that as well. So one could intervene uh, early. So, Eric, do you see, uh, you talked about immunosuppression a little bit, do you see antibodies developed against the change in the protein sequence, so antibodies directed against those changes? We have not looked carefully at that, so I, I would say in the dogs, we did not see uh, antibo antibodies against dystrophin. Um, in these uh, studies with the cardiomyopathies, we've not looked, not looked at that. Other questions? Yeah, Howard. Oh, Howard. Eric, great talk. So um, the, uh, it wasn't clear if the, your patients are all autosomal dominant or they ha compound heterozygous. Depends uh, on the mutation. Right. So the question is, how many different guides are you going to need to develop to treat at least, at least one patient or maybe like at least half the patients with that certain disease? Yeah, this is... A, going to be an issue going forward with many genetic disorders because at, at least at this point it's not practical to develop a unique guide for every individual patient's mutation and that's because I mean the FDA has a really strict requirements which we're dealing with right now on testing for guide specificity and off-target and so it's not going to be a one-size-fits-all. But there are large numbers of patients that have these individual mutations that I described. And certainly with the Duchenne work, the way we've approached that is we've started with guides that can correct the largest percentage of, popu of the population, and that's roughly 15% of all boys with Duchenne can be corrected with a single guide. And then it goes down from there. And we believe with approximately five guides, in, we could treat at least half of the world population with Duchenne. So that's, I think that's the way it's going to have to go initially. But ultimately, I think as this technology advances and as LNPs come online, so which will bypass the manufacturing challenges of AAV, then I think it's going to be possible to expand these uh, indications more broadly. Any other questions? Sure. Tom. Well, thank you.